Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Now, I understand there are no documents to be tabled by the clerk and no committees to meet. Senators, yesterday I informed the Senate of the death on the 16th of May 2019 of the Honourable Robert James Lee Hawke AC a member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Wills, Victoria, from 1980 to 1992, and Prime Minister of Australia from 1983 to 1991. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former member and Prime Minister, the Honourable Robert James Lee Hawke, IC. Leave is granted. I move that the Senate records its deep regret at the death on, 18, on 16 May 2019 of the Honourable Robert James Lee Hawke IC, former Member for Wills and Prime Minister of Australia, places on record its appreciation of, for his long and highly distinguished service to the nation and tenders its profound sympathy to his family uh, in their bereavement. Uh, Mr President, Australians mourn the loss of our 23rd Prime Minister. And in so doing, we do not simply grieve the passing of a distinguished former leader. Uh, in many ways, we grieve the passing of a close and enduring friend. One of the great strengths of our democratic tradition is that for all the rough and tumble of partisan politics, we are all able to identify individuals ac across all sides of politics who love our country dearly and work to make it a better place. In the life of the Honourable Robert James Lee Hawke, IC, GCL, we see a love for his country that burned brightly and that was warmly returned by his fellow Australians. Bob Hawke's life was one of great purpose, uh, steered by a sense of destiny from an early age. He was born on the 9th of December 1929 to Clem Hawke, a Congressionalist minister and wife, Ellie, a school teacher. Bob was raised in Border Town, South Australia, before his family moved to the great state of Western Australia and settled in the suburb of West Leaderville in 1939. That move followed the tragic death of his brother, Neil, at the age of 17. And Bob also almost died at the same age in a motorbike accident a near-death experience which had a profound and lasting impact on him. His intellect and capacity for leadership were obvious from a very young age. He completed his secondary studies at Perth Modern School and graduated with degrees in law and arts from the University of Western Australia in 1952, after a year spent as the university's student guild president. It was during that period that he joined the Australian Labor Party, which was hardly a surprise given the great uh, Labor pedigree of the Hawke family. His father had served as General Secretary of the South Australian Labor Party and his uncle, Albert Hawke, was the Labor Premier of Western Australia through much of the 1950s. Bob won a Rhodes Scholarship and moved to the United Kingdom, where he abandoned his initial study plans to write a thesis on the history of Australia's wage fixing system. The decision was vintage Hawke. Uh, turning his education in one of the world's most ancient and august institutions towards practical issues that would help him shape the lives of his countrymen. At Oxford, he famously set the world record for sculling a yard glass of beer in just 11 seconds. Completing such a feat surely allows us to reflect on Bob Hawke as being worthy of the title Scholar Athlete, 
although not perhaps in the traditional sense of the term. He graduated from Oxford with a Bachelor of Letters in 1955 and returned to Australia the following year. Bob briefly moved to Canberra to begin doctoral studies at the Australian National University, but those uh, plans uh, were not to last. He moved to Melbourne where he settled in the beachside suburb of Sandringham with his wife Heisel and their young family. He started work at the Australian Council of Trade Unions, quickly establishing a name for himself as its most effective advocate, including early successes in the 1959 Bicic Voyages decision. From there, his rise within the union movement began in full force, culminating in his election as ICTU president in 1969, following the retirement of Albert Monk. Bob's time at the helm of the ICTU raised his national profile and set him on an inevitable path to federal parliament. He unsuccessfully contested the seat of Corio in the 1963 federal election, defeated by long-serving Liberal member Sir Hubert Opperman. But he continued to work for the ICTU, establishing a reputation for consensus and dispute resolution. He was also willing to give moral and social right to the ICTU's actions, as seen in his support for demonstrations against apartheid during the visit of the South African Springboks rugby team in 1971. Bob's effectiveness at the helm of the ICTU saw him join the ILP's national executive in 1971, before his election as the party's federal president in 1973. He was a member of the Reserve Bank Board and on the Australian Population and Immigration Council. His electoral popularity became obvious as the Labor Party recovered from the demise of the Whitlam government in 1975. Many viewed him as an inevitable Labor leader and a prospective Prime Minister. His parliamentary career began when he won the seat of Wills in North Melbourne in October 1980. When Bob took his place in the House of Representatives, he was already a well-known figure with a formidable track record. He had been appointed as a companion of the Order of Australia in January 1979, a year before he had even entered the Parliament. His maiden speech in the House articulated his vision for the nation and his specific prescriptions for successful national leadership. He called for steps to be taken to eradicate uh, the cancer of poverty uh, in the midst of affluence. The speech also made it clear that the collegiate consensus style that had become his trademark at the ICTU would not be left outside the door. He stated his belief in the importance of a preparedness on the part of government to plan, to coordinate, and on the basis of mutual understanding to bring the legitimate elements of our society cohesively together. In hindsight, few would doubt that Bob Hawke possessed that preparedness in full. He initially served as Shadow Minister for Industrial Relations, Employment and Youth Affairs under then Labour leader Bill Hayden. But in the eyes of many, there was only ever one destination, the leadership of the Australian Labour Party and the Prime Ministership. In July 1982, during the ILP's Federal Conference at Canberra's Lakeside Hotel, Bob launched his first attempt to replace Bill Hayden and lost just by a few votes. After further Rumblings, I guess is how you best describe it, and further internal discussions, no doubt, uh, Bill Hayden stood down to make way for his rival. Bob was elected to the Labour leadership on the 3rd of February 1983 and went on to fight and win the 1983 election, becoming Prime Minister just two years after entering the federal parliament. In government, Bob leveraged his electoral mandate, his remarkable and enduring popularity, and his strong capacity for team building and consensus to bring his party to the political center on a range of issues. He worked with his treasurer, friend, and eventual rival, uh, Paul Keating, on a formidable reform agenda. Those reforms helped lay the foundation stones for the modern Australian economy, and I know that many of them, of course, at the time, received the strong support of the uh, then uh, coalition opposition, reflecting a bipartisan commitment to important economic reforms in the national interest, which decades later, the Australian people uh, still uh, rightly uh, expect and deserve. That period ushered in so many of the economic structures and settings that are taken for granted today. The floating of the dollar and the removal of controls on foreign exchange, dramatic reductions in tariffs in favour of free trade, the reduction of income tax rights a number of times, and the removal of export controls on bulk commodities. 
Bob coaxed Australia's unions into supporting significant industrial relations reforms, including the introduction of a new system of enterprise bargaining, which reduced the level of uh, industrial disputes that had been uh, a hallmark of the previous periods. Another unique trait of Bob's leadership was the respect he earned from much of the nation's business community. Be it at the National Economic Summit of April 1983, which marked the beginning of his reform effort, through to the conclusion of his prime ministership. Few could doubt Bob's success came from bringing employer organizations and unions together. He deserves praise for his uh, command and leadership of the cabinet. Uh, he, is, uh, he is well, uh, he's highly regarded as a superb cabinet chairman, well briefed across the detail and courteous to all ministers uh, at, at all levels. He afforded ministers broad latitude except in the key areas of economic reform and foreign policy. Beyond Australia's borders, Bob was also a highly regarded, well-grounded leader, prioritizing the alliance with the United States and seeking to take advantage of the declining Cold War by promoting our nation as a responsible and active middle power. I also commend his firm commitment to the State of Israel, a position that at times uh, earned him the ire of some of his colleagues, but which showed his commitment to our nation's democratic fellow travelers. Bob can be attributed with a range of significant reforms uh, across a number of portfolios, from the establishment of the Australian Electoral Commission to the listing of many pr uh, precious Australian wonders as World Heritage Sites, as well as important progress uh, on uh, the Y2 gender equality. His legacy stretches beyond uh, his policy brief. He was a great celebrator of our national life, a man whose leadership showed a deep personal affection for Australia and its people. The joyous minutes in 1983 that followed Australia winning the America's Cup for the first time will be forever etched in our national consciousness. Bob, clad in the Australian flag jacket, spoke as the voice of Australian celebration when he declared that any boss who sucks anyone for not turning up today is a bum. And my staff was worried whether I would be prepared to say that in the Senate <laughs> chamber. <laughs> his genius was so often uh, in his larrikin humanity and his willingness to share his full, unvarnished self with his fellow, his self with his fellow Australians. The good times and the bad, the laughter and the tears. In time, the nation's weakening economy and rising tensions with Paul Keating, Paul Keating took their toll. Having won an initial leadership ballot against uh, Paul Keating, Bob refused to bend to mounting pressure and resign. He stood firm, but ultimately uh, was defeated in a second ballot, being replaced by Paul Keating as Prime Minister on the 20th of December 1991. Two months later, he resigned from the Parliament, having spent the majority of his nearly 12 years in this place as Australia's leader. I mean, how remarkable, 12 years in Parliament and um, such a, a, an absolutely remarkable, amazing uh, contribution and impact on uh, our uh, nas national fortunes. In 1994, he published the Hawke Memoirs and following uh, his separation uh, from Heisel in 1995, he married Blanche Dalpuget with whom he shared the final decades of his life. At the same time, he delved into the business uh, world, taking on a range of directorships. His political fire was never doused and he would at times take to the public arena in support of causes that he believed in and supported. When on the hustings, he had a remarkable ability, even in advanced age, to connect with the Australian people, to stoke that old fire, draw a crowd, and uh, enthrall an audience. His larrikin antics continued to delight uh, his everyday Australians, including very recently when he sculled a beer in front of ecstatic spectators at the Sydney Cricket Ground. The, uh, the honours that he accrued throughout his decades in public life uh, continued into his uh, later years. In 1997, the University of South Australia established a Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre, a Hawke Research Institute and a Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Library. Yet for all of the accolades received, the policy reforms landed and the books, biographies and newspapers filled with the story of his remarkable life, Bob's everyday Australian decency was the thing that shone brightest. In Bob's remarkable life and transformative leadership, we see so much of the promise and greatness uh, of Australia. And I should just uh, pause here, and uh, I was asked in uh, recent weeks whether I had ever met Bob Hawke myself, and uh, indeed I did. Um, and um, 
it was a very special occasion, the Boa Forum um, in uh, 2015, where through some sort of uh, coincidence, the Governor General, uh, Sir Peter Cosgrove, Bob Hawke and myself ended up sitting around the table having a cup of tea. Um, but there were lots of people behind the windows looking at us on the balcony and the Governor General took out three cigars. Now remember, this is uh, uh, in <laughs> March 2015. <laughs> and uh, and I, was, I, was, I was carefully thinking whether I should uh, accept one of those three cigars. And I mean, Bob didn't hesitate. And <laughs> as much as I've uh, sort of been on the receiving end of some, you know, um, derisory commentary for uh, being sort of partial to the occasional cigar. He had no such hesitation and he got his cigar going pretty quick. And as I was sort of thinking about the mobile phones with cameras on the other side of the window and what I should be doing, uh, the other two cigars disappeared in Bob's pocket. <laughs> so the political dilemma was averted, uh, for, which I'm eternally, for which I'm eternally grateful. Um, you know, I, I, I think that he could see that there was an alignment of interests between uh, him and myself at that particular point in time. And I mean, that is also during that particular trip, um, uh, I uh, experienced Bob's singing uh, of, uh, you know, waltzing Matilda, among other things. And it was, it was, it was just amazing. I mean, there were business leaders uh, you know, from Australia and from other parts of the world, and uh, Bob was leading them in song. And uh, you know, very, very special, and certainly to have been able to see firsthand and very directly uh, the way uh, he uh, connects with people at all levels uh, was, was very uh, special indeed. His beloved wife, Blanche, in the weeks following his passing, revealed that Bob always uh, saw his life in terms of its contribution to society. In peaceful rest, Robert James Lee Hawke leaves behind a legacy for the ages. He has earned a unique place in the history of our nation, which he loved so deeply and whose people loved him so very much in return. So in closing, it is to his wife Blanche, whose words at his recent memorial touched so many of us, and to Bob's family and friends, including his surviving children, Susan, Stephen and Rosalind, his six grandchildren and his great-grandchildren, that on behalf of the government and in tribute to a truly great Australian, I join with my colleagues in this place in offering uh, our sincerest condolences. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and I rise on behalf of the opposition to speak on this condolence motion. And I thank the leader of the government in the Senate for his words that preceded me. Well, today we acknowledge the passing of an exceptional Australian and an exceptional member of the Labor family, the Honourable Robert James Lee Hawke AC, who passed away in May at the age of 89. Bob Hawke was loved. He was loved by our movement. He was loved by Australians. But today I start by expressing our deeper sympathy to those who loved him and those closest to him to Blanche, to Bob's children, Stephen and Rosalind, his stepson Louis, all of his grandchildren and his many friends. And so too today we remember Hazel. I also acknowledge his former staff. I saw Craig Emerson emceeing the, the service and today in the chamber is Lou Cullen. She's going to be very embarrassed I mention her, who works for me, who, wor who works with me, who was Bob Hawke's media assistant. Mr President, I was honoured to be amongst the thousands who celebrated his life at the memorial service held at the Sydney Opera House. And today our parliament, this central institution of the Australian democracy, comes together to pay tribute to a man who enriched our nation. The Hawke chapter in Australia's democratic story is remarkable. It is a quintessentially Australian story, a story of achievement and a story of reform. A vision of a country that could be a better Australia, a nation in which the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and a reminder of what democracy can be. Progress and reform driven by values that is led, that is advocated, and that is adopted. Bob Hawke's ability to lead, his vision, his values, saw him dominate the Australian political stage for two decades. 
but Bob Hawke's contribution to public life and his deep connection with the Australian people lasted a lifetime. His influence resonated, resonates today as the economic reforms over which he presided continue to deliver sustained economic growth over a time span unparalleled in the nation's economic history. The years of uninterrupted economic growth that we have enjoyed are the true legacy of Bob Hawke's vision and energy. He came to office in 1983 inheriting a moribund, closed economy mired in deep recession. And together with Paul Keating, the greatest partnership in Australian politics, he led reform that created modern Australia, the modern Australian economy, and laid the foundations for all of us who followed. And he did this through consultation and cooperation. Without the massive social upheaval that was a feature of similar economic transformations overseas, this was the defining feature of his style of leadership, because Bob Hawke worked to bring people together. He sought to unite, not to divide. His 1983 campaign slogan was Bob Hawke, bringing Australia together. And when Bob Hawke was confronted with the threat of race being used as a political weapon, he responded by demonstrating decency and the bipartisan commitment to an Australia that was culturally diverse, tolerant and open. As his long-standing press secretary, Barry Cassidy, said, he wouldn't cop racism, he just wouldn't cop it at any level. At the very whiff of it, he'd be right onto it. Well, here's an example modern politics could learn from. Bob Hawke lived his life beyond full, and his legacy has affected and will go on affecting all of us. We are the beneficiaries of a truly great Australian. The contours of his life are remarkable. South Australians know he was a South Australian. Born in our home state, my home state in Bordertown in 1929, and I was very pleased at Labor's commitment in the lead up to the election to purchase the home in which he was born and to preserve it as a memorial, transforming, transforming it into a museum, celebrating his life and achievements, Australian democracy and civic life. It was Bob's wish, and I would invite the government to consider doing this. I hope they will adopt this, this proposition. Bob Hawke went on to live in Western Australia, so to Western Australians he's a Western Australian, and be a Rhodes Scholar, scholar for that state. He went on to represent an electorate in Victoria, so he's a Victorian as well, and finally he lived out his retirement years in New South Wales, a life lived across this great nation, a true Australian. The breadth of Bob Hawke's domestic successes sometimes overshadows his remarkable contribution to the great Labor foreign policy tradition. And I do wish to make a few, a few remarks about this. Because with Curtin, Chifley and Whitlam, Hawke too had a profound sense of our national interests and a profound attachment to the values which underpin them. His genius was in the way he built and maintained relationships. And the foundation of this was his authenticity, be it with individuals or groups, he was the same. See, Bob was the same with trade union members and bosses, his political allies and his opponents, his punters at the races, his mates at the footy, his co-drinkers at the pub, and there are a few of them. Bob Hawke connected with everyone, and his ability to connect with world leaders was extraordinary. But despite his charm, he wasn't a salesman and he didn't trade in slogans. Rather, he had an eye for strategic opportunity and a powerful instinct for strategic significance. Whether it was dealing with China, the United States or India, Bob Hawke could seize the moment, especially with those who shared his optimism and his courage. And that was one thing he did demonstrate consistently. It takes determination and courage to deliver the outcomes that make the world a better place. And through his public life, he was deftly strategic, deftly strategic in his approach. For example, in the advocacy for improved conditions and pay for workers, 
the social wage, collaborating with major retailers to improve the purchasing power of working people, reforming the underpinnings of the economy, strengthening the alliance of the United States, strengthening the trade relationship with China and cementing a better relationship with Papua New Guinea. But of course, the signature achievement of Bob Hawkes was to set the foundations for APEC. As his prime ministership matured, Bob Hawke came to see that the absence of a regional forum to broker global and regional trade and investment issues left the region as a whole vulnerable to being picked off and divided in global trade negotiations. He raised the idea with his South Korean counterpart in January 1989, and the warm response encouraged him to initiate a sustained diplomatic campaign which culminated in the first APEC meeting in November of 1989, which is remarkable remarkably quick progress in a matter of such sensitivity and complexity. Perhaps in many respects, where APEC was an organisation waiting to happen, but its establishment required leadership, which is what Hawke and this nation provided. So APEC remains a testament to Bob Hawke's insight and foresight, and a testament to a Labor government's willingness for Australia as a substantial power in the region to pro promote, broker and drive regional solutions. Bob Hawke's capacity for sustained and long-term strategic investment is also illustrated by his decade-long engagement with regional partners and the international community in resolving challenges in Cambodia, which persisted throughout the decade. Bob Hawke, Bill Hayden and Gareth Evans persevered, laying the groundwork, making critical diplomatic investment that culminated in the 1991 Paris Peace Accords. Bob Hawke brought, brought great skill and insight to change the nature of some of our mo most important bilateral relationships. His authenticity cut through language and culture because it connects us as people. He built early relationships with China, carefully laying the beginnings of our remarkable economic relationship. As Bob Hawke said to Premier Zhao in 1986, and I quote, this generation has before it the real prospect of our region emerging for the first time in history as a place of prosperity for all our peoples. Well, he had prescience. That was in 1986, and the region is now the engine room of the global economy. Bob Hawke saw the economic development and increasing social and political reforms in China as the most strategically significant change to the global balance, and he was right. And Bob Hawke was deeply affected by the violence of the military crackdown on student protesters in Tiananmen Square that began on 4th June 1989. And it led to his decision to grant permanent residence status to 42,000 Chinese students then studying in Australia. Many of them are now Australian citizens, part of his enduring legacy. And Bob Hawke was also able to build an authentic relationship with key leaders in the United States. He approached our key alliance partner, acutely conscious of the concerns abroad in the wider Australian community then about the joint facilities, concerns about the threat of nuclear weapons, global worries about the knock-on effects of the failure of detente and the deployment of new missile systems in Europe. Recognising there was a shared sense of opportunity and vision that could shape a world that could be passed on to future generations, he worked effectively to set the direction of the relationship and strengthened our relationship with the United States based on the alignment of national interests. Bob Hawke knew how to connect with people emotionally and his public, whether it was his public show of emotion at the brutal and tragic loss of life in the Tiananmen crackdown or a more personal interaction or him on national television merrily demanding that everyone get the day off, everyone has our own great memories and anecdotes about Bob Hawke. Many have been recounted in weeks, in the weeks since his passing. Every time I met Bob, he was optimistic, ebullient, and telling me what to do. I do recall seeing him at one point uh, post the 2013 loss, going to see him in his office, and he said, how are you, love? And I said, oh, you know, it's pretty hard being in opposition. He said, oh, well, I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Not much more to say, really. <laughs> Bob Hawke was a peerless Australian. He had a passion for the nation Australia could become, and he had the capacity to transform his vision into reality. His ability to forge consensus for change, forming broad coalitions based on appeal to shared objectives, stands before all of us 
as an example of what is possible in a progressive democracy. His conduct of Australia's international relations was founded on the idea that if our nation were to sustain and build its economic power, our economic and foreign policies needed to operate hand in hand. And it is precisely this insight which continues to inspire Labor to build on his remarkable foreign policy legacy of relationships in our region, strategic alliances and multilateral engagement. Just as Curtin, Chifley and Whitlam left an indelible mark on the character of Australia's domestic and foreign policy, so too did Bob Hawke. And the nation remains indebted to this remarkable Labor Prime Minister. We mourn Bob's passing, but we are strengthened by the knowledge that his legacy will endure. Bob Hawke knew how to lead. He brought both intellect and passion to the task. He led with heart and head. And he knew how to bring Australians together. He knew how to fire our imaginations and how to inspire us. And Bob Hawke spoke to hope, not fear. He encouraged opportunity, not timidity. He rebuffed division and he confronted prejudice. He fostered unity and a belief in the collective, and he urged us to look beyond and to look ahead. He inspired, he argued, he cajoled, he joked, and he convinced us. He changed our nation for the better. And that is what Labor governments do. They change the nation for the better and none more so than his. Farewell, Bob Hawke. The Labor Party thanks you. The nation honours you. And the opposition again today expresses our deepest sympathy to his family and his friends. Senator Di Natale. Uh, Mr President, I rise on behalf of the Australian Greens to pay tribute to the life of uh, Bob Hawke. Uh, Bob Hawke was uh, a hero uh, in our Household. My grandfather idolised Bob Hawke. The names Whitlam and Hawke were etched into my consciousness as a young kid, learning about this thing called politics. Now, here's my grandfather, fresh off the boat, young family from Italy, post-war Italy, trying to start a life here. Came here with nothing but a suitcase, and here was this bloke, Bob Hawke, who spoke to him and so many families like him, migrants from many different countries, who knew that this was a man who loved them, who cared for them, who respected them. He was a man who valued them and wanted them to be part of Australia's future. I mean, in some ways, Bob Hawke was part of the reason I'm here. I remember as a young kid, um, my uncle, the youngest of the children, the bloke who introduced me to bushwalking and to come to love the Australian environment, decided to pack up his bags in Brunswick and head off to Tassie because he wanted to go and save this wild river called the Franklin. He was a hero to me and I remember sitting there arriving at the house in Brunswick, Maul and Leader open on the table and there was a picture of my uncle who'd just been arrested in the campaign to save the Franklin. There was no one cooler than my uncle for, do, for doing what he believed in. My grandmother wore black, and I reckon that was the day she started wearing black. Um, the memory uh, of seeing her um, with her rosary beads, praying to God to rescue my uncle's soul uh, for doing uh, what he'd done and brought, bringing shame to the family. You know, it was... Bob Hawke's leadership on so many issues, and particularly on the environment, that was so inspiring to many of us. He's arguably the Prime Minister who's done more to protect our natural environment than any Prime Minister before or since. Just think about his legacy from the Kakadu and the Daintree tropics in the north, the moratorium on mining in Antarctica, Shark Bay in the west. The Gondwan and rainforests in the east, in Uluru, Katajuta, uh, uh, in the centre, of course, Tasmania's uh, wilderness and world heritage listings. I mean, they were all part of what Bob Hawke did to leave this country a better place. I, I was looking at Bob Hawke's statement to, on the environment, our country, our future. I'd recommend it uh, to anybody who uh, cares about the future of our planet. Um, it's interesting the way he talked about the environment. 
And this could come straight out of a Greens policy statement. The environment ultimately sustains all life on earth. Plants and animals provide us with food, clothing, shelter, etc. Um, he talks about the world's resources as finite, uh, ecosystems around us with a limited capacity to regenerate after damage. He talks about the social and economic benefit of preserving the environment. But what he goes on to say is that while plants and animals are useful, we as their custodians have a responsibility towards their preservation. Plants and animals have intrinsic value in and of themselves, and many people believe that, as such, they have a right to survive and that we have a moral obligation to preserve them. That's, that's leadership. That's tremendous leadership. He talks about the threats to the environment. We've got little time to spare. The cumulative effects of past mistakes in our care for the environment are still to fully emerge, and to proceed with ignorant and unthinking ways risks future irreparable damage. We can't continue to squander the Earth's assets. He was prescient on climate change as well. He talks about what needs to be done to reduce carbon dioxide emissions in this statement from 1989. The scope to enhance energy efficiency and energy cons conservation. The role of carbon dioxide emissions in Australia and what we can do to reduce them in the transport sector from motor vehicles. The objective to reduce transport energy consumption per capita through public transport and land use planning. All things that we're talking about today. He was a champion for the environment. Some people have highlighted the parallels between the campaigns on the Franklin and, of course, the campaign that we're fighting today to stop the Adani coal mine from going ahead. If you look back at the Franklin River, it's true there were divided views within all parties. There were voracious and greedy corporations desperate to see that project go ahead. A lot of local conservative politicians telling those out-of-towners to bugger off. But you had a growing grassroots environment movement committed to the preservation of Australia's precious places. What separates those issues is 35 years and the courage and leadership of Bob Hawke. In the 1983 election that brought him to power and saw all seats lost by Labor in Tassie, yet on the night of the election, after acknowledging his win and the hard work of his colleagues, the next people he acknowledged were Tasmanians. This is what he said to them. I want to give you, the people of Tasmania, the confidence that my government will be particularly concerned with the issues that were close to your mind when you cast your vote. My government will go ahead to honour the promises that we've made, but the dam will not go ahead. Your concern legitimacy with issues of power and employment, and I've made it clear that we'll meet your concerns. So from this moment, I commit myself and undertaking a task of national reconciliation. I ask, you, uh, ask that you give us your trust and cooperation. And if we work together, there will be no bounds as to what we can do together. He showed leadership. He sought to unite. He didn't equivocate. He worked hard to provide people with alternatives, and he succeeded. It was Barry Jones, Bob Hawke's science minister, who told Fairfax that he'd brooded a lot about the likelihood of such interventions now. He said if there was a comparable situation to the Tasmanian Dam dispute in 2019, would we act in the same way that we did? And Mr Jones said, I'm not sure that we would. Bob Hawke was a leader. It's important to note that he was a leader, but he was surrounded also by giants. He showed leadership at a time when leadership was necessary. He worked with his colleagues, a talented group of individuals, one of the most talented cabinets in Australia's history. But he was able to bring out those talents. He was able to work with people. He was a consensus builder. He made sure 
that each and every one of those individuals shined. It's important to note, too, that his legacy was not one that has been universally embraced. He made some very important economic reforms, and they were tough reforms. He introduced capital gains tax. He tightened up fringe benefits. He introduced the shock absorber of a floating exchange rate, all important for Australia's future economic prosperity. But I suppose some of the gloss for many people started to wear off in successive governments with the privatisation of public assets and some, the deregulation of the finance sector and so on. Ultimately, it was many of those reforms that led many people, again, some of them my family, my friends, the people involved in the textiles industry and manufacturing, when we saw the unleashing of Reaganomics, uh, Thatcherite uh, policies, here what we called economic rationalism, and we know that it tilled the ground for some of those reforms that we've now seen, the privatisation of our health system through a private health insurance, the inordinate amount of funding that goes to uh, private schools at the expense of public schools. Uh, but having said all of those things, his legacy nonetheless is an overwhelmingly positive one. Uh, if we look at today's political environment, it's hard to see how someone like Bob Hawke indeed uh, would be able to rise to the heights that he was able to. When you consider um, his, uh, his life before politics, when you consider that right now everybody's deeds Every personal misstep is captured with digital fingerprints forever, dug up by political dirt units once candidates are nominated. You wonder about whether Bob Hawke would have been Prime Minister today, and that would have been a great loss to our country. He left an important legacy for Australia. He warned us of the threat of global warming years before coal, oil and gas companies marshalled their resources to fight the science and to create fear within our community. Let me close by uh, putting the question he put uh, to all Australians on World Environment Day in 1989. He said, are we looking after it? We don't inherit our planet, we borrow it not simply for ourselves but for our kids and our grandkids. The greenhouse effect is the potential to change in a single lifetime the way all nations and people live and work. Care for our planet as you would care for our children. Their tomorrow depends on our actions today. Impassioned, heartfelt, said with meaning. Who can forget the leadership he showed when it came to fighting apartheid in South Africa? Or the tears that rolled down his face, the snot pouring out of his nose as he stood up with that impassioned and heartfelt speech in response to the massacre in Tiananmen Square, where he said to the country, without talking to a focus group, without seeking to consult with the bureaucracy, we will give you refuge in our country. He showed leadership. He showed the country what it was to be somebody who cared, who felt deeply, and would argue his case, regardless of the consequences, because he believed in the power of people. He believed in uniting this nation. He believed in caring for those Australians who chose to make this place their home. And he believed that we are custodians of this precious, small, blue speck floating in space and that it was our moral duty to preserve it and to leave it in better shape for future generations. Vale Bob Hawke. We give our sympathies to all of his family and friends. We are a better place because Bob Hawke was the Prime Minister of this country. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, many thoughtful words have already been spoken about former Prime Minister Bob Hawke, his contribution and his character. 
And on behalf of the Nationals, my contribution today will reflect on his life and work, in particular as it relates to rural and regional Australia. Labor PMs are not generally remembered for their connection to rural and regional Australia, but Bob Hawke, an exception in so many ways, certainly had a lasting impact on the regions and our industries. And look, for the ex geners here in the audience, it went far beyond his memorable cameo addressing the kids at Burrigan School in a country practice. Bob Hawke's presence in the regions were felt almost immediately on him becoming Prime Minister. In 1983, within the first weeks, few weeks, there was a fortuitous breaking of a long drought, one of the worst in Australia's last century. And don't we wish we could summon those same powers uh, now to bring respite to our farmers who are battling another prolonged and cruel drought across so much of regional Australia? His birthplace was in Bordertown, regional South Australia. Uh, part of a district which has a long history in agriculture and is led primarily by cereal crops and livestock farming. The first Hawke cabinet is widely acknowledged as being the best Labor post-World War II cabinet, in large part because of the diversity within its ranks. That included a shearer in Mick Young and not one but two farmers in John Kerrin and Peter Walsh. Bob Hawke deserves recognition for the strength of his first ministry and for his appreciation of the importance of agriculture to our national economy. In his election speech, delivered in February 1983, he told voters, no Australian resource is more important than our land, no sector of Australian industry is more important than our great primary industries, which still provide 50 per cent of Australia's export income in normal circumstances. In his book, John Kerrin spoke of his difficulties in convincing the then Treasurer Paul Keating, and it's no surprise that agriculture should be front and centre of the economic policy debate. But it was clear that uh, Bob Hawke needed less convincing. That said, there was some unrest in rural and regional Australia directed at the Hawke government's economic changes during this time. His ability to draw a crowd was once again on show when 45,000 of our farmers descended on Canberra in 1985 to protest high interest rates, the threat of higher taxes, high fuel costs and low commodity prices. But to Bob Hawke's credit, he fronted those far farmers. And the Hawke government's economic reforms ultimately deserve some credit for helping to advance Australian agriculture. The Hawke government contributed to the further liberalisation of ag trade, which has continued under subsequent governments. And Bob Hawke and John Kerrin recognised the importance of rural research and development in delivering productivity growth and international competitiveness. They also recognised that the benefits from rural research extended to consumers and new, produ new production and more jobs in regional communities. And so this led to the creation of research and development corporations where research is undertaken on behalf of farmers and the broader community in partnership, with the costs shared through both industry levies and taxpayer funding. In 1985, Bob Hawke officially opened the National Farmers Federation House in Canberra. The NFF is a lead peak body for agriculture and continues to play a pivotal role in policy development and advocacy across the country. And like good, all good advocacy group, Bob Hawke and the NFF didn't always see eye to eye. And as the story goes, the then NFF president, Ian McLaughlin, was once on the receiving end of Hawke's sharp tongue. He had an appointment with the Prime Minister and planned to deliver a blunt message on behalf of Australian farmers. But Mr McLaughlin decided to practice his lines at a media doorstep on the way into Old Parliament House. The story goes that the president of the NFF was left in the Cabinet room for an hour, and when the PM Hawke finally arrived, the message was short, sharp and extremely colourful. The Prime Minister made it clear he was unimpressed about being lectured to uh, through the media. Bob Hawke left a lasting legacy in rural and regional Australia through his role in the evolution of the Landcare movement. He is considered one of the fathers of Landcare for his launch of the movement during his Prime Ministership. Few would have thought that when he stood at the junction of the Murray and the Darling Rivers in 1989 and announced the start of the decade of Landcare, the movement will grow to what it is today. The decade of land care is now in its third decade, celebrating its 30th anniversary. There were many others involved in land care's initial creation, such as the late Rick Farley and the late uh, Philip Toyne. But Hawke's support of this emerging movement gave it legitimacy and a champion in the highest office of the country. 
Bob Hawke's words resonated with farmers and the environmental movement. We should always acknowledge that farmers care deeply about the environment too. Bob Hawke's call to action brought people together for a common cause. At that Wentworth address, he spoke about the importance of cooperation to care for the land. And I quote, the degradation of our environment is not simply a local problem, nor a problem for one state or another, nor the Commonwealth alone. Rather, the damage being done to our environment is a problem for us all, and not just the government, but all of us individually and together. Land care was built on that spirit of cooperation that has made it what it is today. He continued to champion land care, and people from all sections of Australian society have continued to join the noble cause of improving our environment and creating more productive farmland. We now have uh, nearly 5,500 land care groups and hundreds and thousands of volunteers across Australia working at the front line. Australian farmers have an international reputation as sustainable land managers, and land care has played a significant role in promoting innovative agricultural practices. And it's a tremendous legacy uh, for Bob Hawke. In 1989, he was also the first Prime Minister to pledge to plant one billion trees to address land degradation, salinity and erosions. And this has led to more than 700 million trees reportedly being planted. And just last year, the Australian government delivered our forestry plan and the plan to grow a billion new plantation trees, and this time it's over the next decade. We will need to meet uh, the demand going into 2050, particularly saw logs for building and construction. We need to ensure Australia's renewable timber and wood fibre industry is better prepared for future challenges and opportunities. Bob Hawke will be remembered for so many contributions to the Australia we know and love today. His contribution to the bush is undeniable. As someone who believes that our nation needs sustainable and prosperous regions just as much as it needs thriving cities, I want to ensure this work was sufficiently recognised in his long list of accomplishments that I'm sure other contributions today will make to the Senate. It's true that Bob Hawke's relationship with the National Party also had its ups and downs. In one instance, during a heated dispute on live exports of all things between meat workers and farmers, Hawke described our former leader, Doug Anthony, as a damned nuisance. I can only conclude that uh, Mr Anthony was doing exactly what all good national leaders do, and that's advocating strongly for the regions and ruffling a few feathers along the way. But Bob Hawke left a lasting impression on the former country party member for Calaire and now one of my constituents in Victoria, Sandy McKenzie. And for those who don't know, Calaire is in uh, New South Wales, who shared a beautiful tribute with me which sums up the measure of uh, Bob Hawke. In 1980, on the day, and this is Sandy's story, on 1980, on the day that the new parliament was sworn in, the new member for Wills, Bob Hawke, popped his head into my office and said, "G'day, I'm a bit new around here, and I'm in the off office next door to you guys." And over the next two years, Sandy and the guy he shared it with, Sam Calder, and Bob Hawke shared many of those larrikin humanity moments. I think that um, Matthias was. Uh, referring to as they started their parliamentary journey together. Uh, obviously then uh, Mr Hawke went on to become Prime Minister and uh, in the nine, this is Sandy, in the 1983 election Bob when campaigning from a truck in Orange saw me in the crowd and called out, hey Sandy you're looking a bit miserable down there, come up here and I'll give you a bit of a hug. I think that actually uh, is a practical measure of his ability to build partnerships and relationships with all people in Australian society. And it's lovely to see someone campaigning to be Prime Minister of this country actually out in a regional community <coughs> talking to us. So on behalf of the National Party, uh, my sympathies to his family, his friends and his many colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. It's appropriate the parliament pauses today to reflect on the life of Robert James Lee Hawke. Bob Hawkey, Australia's 23rd Prime Minister. Few people have so fundamentally changed the course of our nation as he did. Even fewer have managed it with such wit and warmth. Bob Hawke possessed an extraordinary characteristic. Simultaneously, he was both every man and leader without peer. Australians responded to Bob Hawke because they saw themselves, their mates, their neighbours in him. But Australians trusted Bob Hawke because they recognised his capacity to diagnose and comprehend the challenges the country faced and his resolve to clear and 
his resolve and clarity in meeting those challenges and making Australia a stronger, fairer place. Long before I moved to Australia, I knew about Bob Hawke. As a political science undergraduate at the University of Dayton in 1989, I wrote two essays on Bob Hawke, one on his commitment that Australia take a leadership role in tackling global pollution, what today we would call emissions reduction, and another essay on the manner in which the Labor leadership transitioned from Bill Hayden to Bob Hawke. I wish I could say I wrote these essays because I possessed the foresight to know how important it would be to have a thorough understanding of both of these topics later in my career. But truth be told, at that stage in my life, living in Ohio, I couldn't even have imagined a set of circumstances in which I would ever meet <coughs> Bob Hawke. That opportunity did arise, however, three years after I married my Australian husband, Ben Keneally. As a young at-home mother in 1999, I supported the Australian Republican movement campaign in the referendum that year. My son Daniel was then 18 months old, and it was his first experience of handing out on election day, sitting in his pram in his Yes t-shirt, handing out how to vote at the polling booth. That night, Ben and I took Daniel to the Yes campaign event, and I spotted the hero of my university essays, Bob Hawke, across the room. Even though the night was not worth celebration for the Yes campaign, Bob received me as an enthusiastic fan as he always did with the countless Australians that he met, with grace, good humor, and an open smile. Bob posed for a photo that is now one of my most cherished possessions. Me clutching Daniel, Daniel clutching a Yes campaign balloon, and Bob Hawke clutching a beer. All of us were happy in that moment. Bob came to office at a crucial time in our collective history. When Donald Horn wrote of the lucky country, he didn't intend it to become a beloved moniker of our great country. Horn's 1964 book described an insular and protectionist society, one that suffered from lethargy and a lack of ingenuity, a relic of British colonialism, adrift in a region when it couldn't comprehend its role or its future. His writing was an indictment of a country in stasis and a call for reform and for a reformer. Some of those criticisms were warranted, and some remnants of Horn's Australia followed us into the 1980s. But that changed in 1983 with Bob Hawke. Today we call ourselves a lucky country with great endearment because we've been a lot luckier since he was our Prime Minister. The Hawke government pursued a wide-ranging progressive agenda of social and economic reform, the likes of which we have never seen before in our country. He floated the dollar, abandoned the old regime, regime of trade tariffs, and opened our economy to the world. He knew the tension this economic shift would cause, but sought to balance against the competing demands of the union movement and industry with the price and income accords. It was an especially bold line for a former trade union official to pursue. It required a deft hand and an enthusiasm for consensus, things that came naturally to a man who'd already been plying his trade in the union movement for decades. Since 1969, Bob had served as the president of the ACTU and earned a reputation as a persuasive and passionate advocate for the rights of ordinary Australians. He didn't win every battle, but he possessed an immense intellect and a knack for leading people to work collaboratively and find where they were willing to compromise to achieve better outcomes for all. Through his role in the labor movement, his popularity grew to outstanding heights. There is one gift that Bob Hawke has given to Australia as Prime Minister that no one and no political party will ever be able to take away. Bob ensured that we would have Medicare, a system of universal health care that remains the envy of many first world countries today. There are few things more universal to all Australians than the green and gold card that sits in each of our wallets or purses. Every Australian will always have Bob Hawke to thank for their health and well-being, an extraordinary legacy that is testament to the things that Bob valued most. Bob acknowledged our neighbours in the Asia-Pacific and the role we as a proud, developed and sovereign nation play on the world stage. When Bob came to office, Australia had one of the lowest school retention rates in the developed world. By the time he left Parliament, he'd more than doubled it. We were fortunate enough to get a Prime Minister who possessed both the great vision for our nation and the necessary ability to bring the country with him through difficult reforms. 
His was a paradigm shift for the Australian people and one that has brought us immense prosperity. It's not a stretch to say that much of the country's unmatched economic success over the last 30 years flows directly from the decisions made in Bob's cabinet in the 1980s or perhaps at the lodge after a couple of games of tennis on a Sunday afternoon. It wasn't just his enormous policy success that defined Bob's time in the parliament. He did enjoy a genuine and enduring affinity with the Australian people. He was, and always will be, an exemplar of our country's inherent Larrikinism and wit. The Prime Minister famously donned the now white, iconic white jacket emblazoned with Australian flags, gave the nation an ironclad excuse for a sickie, or on some days was known to be more focused on the horses he was backing than the TV cameras surrounding him. At the same time, he was a Prime Minister who wasn't afraid to shed a tear when sharing his shortcomings as a parent or as he watched his fellow man and woman face egregious regimes abroad. That persona of Bob Hawke, larger than life, unpretentious and frank, has sometimes overwhelmed our understanding of his accomplishments. Behind the cheeky smile was a sensitivity, complemented by his towering intellect and a courageous commitment to fighting injustice wherever he saw it. On the domestic front, Bob was an unwavering warrior for equality and social justice. Bob prioritized the advancement of women in the workplace, passing two key pieces of legislation, the Sexual Discrimination Act and the Affirmative Action Act that still underpin our current system today. Bob was a proud environmentalist and his efforts to preserve our beautiful sunburnt country can be witnessed in the natural wonders of the Daintree Forest, Shark Bay and Gondwana Rainforest. Bob co-signed the historic Barunga Statement in 1988, returned Uluru to its traditional owners and fought for a treaty with our First Nations people. Internationally, Bob understood the role that passionate but disciplined diplomacy could play in promoting the values of liberal democracy in a world undergoing significant upheaval. During his time with the ACTU, he had campaigned for the rights of Jewish families attempting to leave the Soviet Union and led boycotts against the apartheid-era South African Springboks rugby union team when they toured Australia in 1971. He loathed racism and was an unrelenting advocate for Nelson Mandela at a time when the great South African leader was decried by many loud voices as a terrorist. But it was his response to the Tiananmen Square massacre that perhaps best characterized Bob's inherent sense of justice. A prime minister on television struggling to hold back tears and promising refuge to persecuted Chinese students who watched as their world was turned upside down from thousands of kilometers away. It was a genuine reflection of the value that Bob so ready, readily placed on his fellow human beings. Bob took bold stances at a time when our society was still struggling with accepting our diversity. It would have been easier to stand quietly by, but it was true to form for a man with such conviction to never take the low road or the easy path. Bob knew that no, there were no small gestures, and he did nothing by half. His was a voice that was listened to by leaders around the world, and it allowed him to advocate on behalf of the fair go that is now shorthand for the very best of what it means to be an Australian. Bob didn't preach to us. He just showed us through actions rather than words, and that, that there is a better way. It meant that he was able to help redefine who we were and what we stood for as a country. He proposed a modern Australia that put a premium on fairness, and he recognized that we had an intrinsic responsibility to do better for each other. And more importantly, he delivered it. In his later years, Bob continued to grow as a stalwart of the labor movement. He tirelessly and enthusiastically campaigned for Labour candidates at state and federal levels across the country. Bob took seriously his role as an elder statesman of our party, as the supporter and nurturer of the next generation of MPs. If you needed Bob Hawke for an endorsement, an appearance, a fundraiser, he more often than not, and per perhaps more often than anyone else, obliged. Now I know this, as a Premier and later as a candidate for the federal seat of Benelong, I was a fortunate in beneficiary of Bob's enthusiasm for a Labour campaign, though I have to say at times his enthusiasm overflowed. 
For example, in 2011, in that tough New South Wales election campaign, Bob joined me on a, the campaign bus for a swing through Western Sydney, culminating in a street walk through and a media conference in Parramatta. Bob had been so well received on Church Street in Parramatta that he was in a particularly good mood. At our media conference, he gave me such a glowing endorsement that he decided he needed to seal it with a kiss, literally. As the photographic evidence will show, just check Google Images, it was plainly evident from my expression that I only realized at the last moment that this kiss was not intended for my cheek. <laughs> what a moment. What a Bob Hawk moment. <laughs> no ill intent, just genuine affection, genuine praise, and a genuine moment of enthusiasm. Anyone who saw the footage could see that's what it was. Nearly 18 years in politics has provided me with lots of significant moments, but getting kissed by Bob, Bob Hawke on the lips during a media conference is certainly amongst the most memorable. <laughs> of course, Bob loved to sing, especially union anthems like Solidarity Forever, and he had a lovely deep voice that resonated around a room. He, uh, he knew that during the Bennelong by-election, uh, that uh, my birthday was just three days later. And though his health was not at his best, he still came to Labor headquarters, get, filmed an endorsement video, gave a rousing you know, speech to the phone bank troops, and then sang me a special rendition of a uh, happy Benelong birthday. His generosity, his friendship, and his love for all of us in the labor movement shined through in such moments. There was no more appropriate celebration of Bob's life than the memorial that was held at the Sydney Opera House last month. It was loud, colorful, and jovial, a celebration of the life of an extraordinary gentleman who recognized the impact his work had on the country that he loved, and we accepted him with profound humility and joy, the loss of him that day. It was quintessentially Bob, he even managed to conduct the orchestra at his own memorial. Only Bob could do that. It's difficult to articulate what we've lost with Bob Hawke's passing. A brilliant mind, an irrepressible wit, an enthusiastic singer, a compassionate and strong leader, our warm friend, our Bob Hawke. A great Australian who steered us from the fog into the present day and in turn delivered so much for so many. Bob once said, the essence of power is the knowledge that what you do is going to have an effect, not just on an immediate, but perhaps a lifelong effect, on the happiness and well-being of millions of people. And so I think the essence of power is to be conscious of what it can mean for others. We owe Bob Hawke a great deal of gratitude for how he used his power for others. My condolences today to Blanche, Sue, Stephen, Rosslyn, his stepson Lewis, and his grandchildren. They were better for having Bob, and we were better for having Bob with us. I'll miss you, Bob. The Australian Labour Party will miss you. Australia misses you. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. This is not my first speech, but as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to speak on behalf of the people of Queensland and giving our condolences to Bob Hawke and his, uh, his family of Bob Hawke, rather. I want to celebrate a life. I don't see this as loss or something that we park in our memory, because funerals are a wonderful time, memorial services, condolences are a wonderful time to celebrate a life well lived. And that is an important thing that we bring, to which we bring truth because it is truth that really shines through. And Bob Hawke was one of Australia's best remembered prime ministers. I can even recall in 1983 being in Singleton's main street, John Street in Singleton, when I heard on the news that he had replaced uh, Bill Hayden as the opposition leader. Now, there are very few things that I tend to remember like that. I, I know where I was when the moon landing occurred, when, uh, when um, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And yet I remember Bob Hawke becoming opposition leader. I actually didn't vote for Bob Hawke in 1983. I voted for Malcolm Fraser, much to my regret. 
but I did vote for Bob Hawke when, he was, when the alternative was Andrew Peacock. And my dad has teased me uh, forever for that because my father was born uh, as an underground coal miner uh, family in Wales and understood the blight that the British Labor movement had put on the coal miners by nationalising their industry. So my father was no friend of the Labor Party and he teased me about voting for Bob Hawke. But later on, my father would also call him the silver bodgy. And that was a term that some people used, but even as a term of derision, it was quite often with affection, which is quite remarkable. And we know that Bob Hawke is one of very, very few people in this country who is known by his first name. People would say Bob, and everyone knew who they were talking about. People say the same about Joe. And the same about Pauline. And I can't think of too many other politicians who everyone across the country knows from their first name only, Bob Hawke. My limited understanding of politics back in, the 19, in, back in, the, uh, in my 20s, in 1980s, was limited because I'd spent three years overseas in America. But as I understand it, John Howard lacked the support from Malcolm Fraser to implement many of the reforms that John Howard sought to implement. But that didn't stop Bob Hawke. He stole them and implemented them. And so did, so did Paul Keating. And they made a wonderful pair, as I understand it. They picked up this whole country. It was like having a group of people and a sheepdog running into the middle and just, and just shaking all the water and the mud off it and, and infecting everyone with its enthusiasm and then wanting to play and take off. And in doing that, Bob Hawke picked up this whole country. He did what his predecessors in the Labor Party failed to do and what his contemporaries in the Liberal Party failed to do, he vastly improved this country. Now he had some of his failures. The ACTU business ventures that failed from memory, there were Burks uh, in Melbourne and Solo uh, petrol stations. His first attempt to run, to run for parliament failed and then he went on later to win four federal elections on the trot. And of course he said something that many people see as cynical. I know I certainly did at the time, and that was his pledge that there would be no, children, no child living in poverty by 1990. And he was clever and bold, and he got away with it. I mean, he was shorter than John Howard, but he referred to John Howard as shorty. And uh, that cheekiness, that boldness, left that tag with, uh, with John Howard. So having, having discussed some of his, his past, uh, uh, past indiscretions, Let's go on to the, most, the, the majority of where I want to talk, his, what I celebrate about Bob Hawke. Number one, his passion flowed. I can remember the tears rolling down Bob, Bob's eyes, when, Bob's cheeks, when we heard about Tiananmen Square. And they were genuine. They were the sorrow, the sadness, the deep hurt, the senselessness of it all. Hey, that man was really in pain when, when he felt that. And then his daughter's battle with, with uh, drug addiction. And the pain there, not only his pain as a father, but his, but his pain for his daughter and her pain. And then we know in Queensland that Bob Hawke attended the Woodford Folk Festival every year for many, many years in a row. And he performed as Bob Hawke in the crowd and sometimes even on the stage. Another thing that I loved about Bob Hawke was that he was not politically correct. He was blunt and direct and he thrived on it. He loved it. In fact, today's Labor would not allow Bob Hawke to be Prime Minister. And yes, he wouldn't cop racism, which is wonderful, nor would he fling around the, ter the term racist idly. And that was significant because he was a man of character in that sense. He had a wonderful sense of humour and a brutal sense of humour. I can remember him dressing down some journalists. And he was especially down to earth. After all, One Nation now has another former Labor federal leader in our party today, who was also down to earth, has a wicked sense of humour. But I think what really matters with Bob Hawke, that gave him his connection with the Australian people, with politics, with the country as a whole, was that he was natural. He was who he was. He didn't pretend to be someone else. He was a larrikin, sure, as many people have talked about, in his behaviour, his approach, his sense of humour. And that's what led him to be so beloved by the people across Australia. Even his political enemies respected him enormously. And he had courage. 
He had the courage to do what the Liberals at the time lacked the courage to do. He had the courage to deregister the BLF in 1986, and recently he spoke out against the CFMEU. And another trait that I loved about Bob Hawke is his leadership abilities. Certainly he had a talented cabinet, I can remember some of them, Button. He had Richo to help him, uh, but he shepherded them, shepherded them, and he did a wonderful job of doing that. He resurrected politics in this country, gave it some energy because he had energy, boundless energy, not just quantity of energy, but he had a quality of energy. And that's what I like about him because that shone through and carried him and it also carried our nation. He initiated and instituted many, many reforms, not only in this country, but overseas. Madam Deputy President, when I was working in the underground coal mines in Kentucky, I came across a wonderful old timer who'd had a stroke and I had to help him out considerably uh, because he couldn't go underground. And we tackled many challenges and, and, and brought in quite a few innovations in, in America. But my friend Guy actually said to me, Malcolm, there is only one thing we leave behind, and that is our name. And Bob Hawke's name is a worthy legacy of a life well lived. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I rise to add my condolences to a great Australian and, by consequence, a great loss to Australia on his passing. Uh, Bob Hawke has become an embodiment of a uniquely Australian form of leadership. Bob's type of leadership can be summed up as a, as a, as a both-and style both determined and irreverent, uh, both successful and humble, and both resolute and kind. I'm not going to repeat the many achievements of Bob's long public career that others have catalogued here today. I, I just want to recognise and reflect on, on, on one aspect of that. Bob was rightly a hero of the Australian Labor Party, but he was also an Australian hero too for what he achieved and how he shaped a better nation. He, he played a key role uh, in removing one of the three stools of what has become called the Australian Settlement. That settlement had effectively guided Australian public policy since our federation. It was first coined by Paul Kelly and it represented basically a collection of, of three, a troika of three different policies that, that went together uh, basically from our founding moments. The first was immigration restrictions and the, the white Australia policy. The second was high protective tariffs to develop a manufacturing industry in Australia, and the third was centralised wage bargaining. The White Australia policy was, of course, dismantled by the Holt government in the 1960s. Centralised wage bargaining wasn't completely removed until the reforms of the Howard government in the late 1990s, but it was Bob Cork and his government that can be credited with the removal of high tariffs, the opening up of the Australian economy uh, to the world, and the foundation of the strong economic growth we've experienced since. I should point out, I want to point out as a member of the Nationalist Party that Bob Hawke did succeed where the country and national parties had long ago failed. It was the country party in the 1930s which first tried to bring down Australia's tariffs. The first coalition agreement between the country party and the United Australia Party uh, actually achieved. This country party successfully argued for the removal of tariffs on a number of items. Uh, of course, the country party's campaign to save farmers money on having to pay tariffs for imported goods was lost. Uh, the later Liberal Party and, and, and the Labor parties at the time were lockstep in support of, of high protection. And so the country party took a different path, took a if you can't beat them, you'll have to join them path, and, uh, and under John McEwen established a protection all round approach where if we we're going to protect our manufacturing industries, we had better protect agriculture too. By the 1970s, however, the bankruptcy of that approach had become evident. Uh, even myself as a child growing up in the 1980s, I remember the distinct concern that something was not quite right with our country. Uh, uh, I remember Japanese exchange students coming here in droves and having all the latest gadgets um, and seemingly much, much wealthier than ourselves and, and terms like Banana Republic and Poor Man, um, Poor White Trash of Asia, etc., were, were uh, thrown around about our nation. Obviously, that, has not, that was not our future. Obviously, in the last 30 years, uh, we carved out a different path than many thought uh, we were headed down in the 1980s. And a lot of the thanks uh, for avoiding uh, that decline or predicted decline does go to the leadership shown by the Hawke government. Reducing tariffs and protection themselves were not easy decisions. It, 
It meant hardship for many Australians that had previously relied on those policies, but it was the right decision to open Australia up to the world, to make ourselves a stronger nation and to lay the foundation of 28 years of uninterrupted economic growth that we have now all enjoyed. The Hawke government's hard decisions were made easier through the general support that was given by the Liberal and National parties through those times. And we have tough decisions today, of course. We have tough decisions around our budget, the development of our regions and our resources, uh, the sustainable management of our environment. A greater degree of bipartisanship would make it a lot easier to make these hard decisions today for our future. Of course, being on this side of the chamber, I did not agree with everything that the Hawke government did. It was under the Hawke government that the <laughs> Labor Party seemingly first discovered the political opium of doing deals with the Green movement to win elections. Uh, that, that first occurred, as been mentioned, with the, the Franklin Dam, but moved on to other issues like the Prominent Hill Mine and others. And whatever the short-term benefits of that approach, the longer-term impacts have been disastrous for the Labor Party, culminating in this year's election where many workers left the once proud, self-described Workers' Party. This approach is simply wrong. It is not right to ignore the local knowledge and local interests of people in Australia at an altar of national political calculation. Hopefully the result of this year's election will help the Labor Party rediscover the central success of the Hawke government's time, which was a focus on economic improvement to make the lives of average Australians better. That is Bob Hawke's shining achievement as leader. He will be rightly remembered as one of the founding parents of modern Australia. For that reason, he has not passed from Australia's memory. He will long be remembered, which I am sure will be of some comfort and condolence to his surviving wife, Blanche, and other loved ones. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. Uh Deputy President, and uh, I rise uh, and associate myself with uh, most of the remarks that have preceded me, perhaps not just the end of uh, Senator Canavan's contribution, but the sense of uh, the great life of an amazing Australian, a man who lived life large, uh, who is a proud, uh, a proud man who led this great Labor Party in the for the benefit of this nation. Um, this week, as we commence the 46th parliament, it's important, I think, to, that we do this today, that we take time to reflect on this great leader of our country, Robert James Lee Hawke. And I want to, uh, at the outset, offer my sincere personal condolences to Bob's family, those who survive him, and of course his, his wife, Hazel, and her amazing contribution uh, that she uh, made to enable him to live the life that he lived, but particularly to Blanche Dalpuget and uh, Bob's surviving children and grandchildren, um, who were so uh, prominent and uh, such a such a joy to uh, witness at the memorial event that we had in Sydney to honour Bob's life, their delight in his life was palpable. Their joy in the celebration of Bob's life conveyed a sense of positivity to the entire occasion. Bob's impact on this great country has been vast, and his legacy will continue for decades to come. His was a period of major and challenging reform in a time when it was desperately needed. In past days and weeks, we've seen Australians far and wide mourn and pay tribute to Labor's longest-serving Prime Minister and one of the absolute giants of this Australian Labor movement. We've been reminded of the breadth of his reform agenda based in sincere love for his fellow Australians. In his partnership with his old friend Paul Keating, he modernised the Australian economy and ensured the unprecedented economic growth that followed in Australia was shared because he knew that the foundation of a good society is laid where its fruits are shared and that those most vulnerable should benefit and be looked after in this great nation. He truly entrenched the importance of a social wage through reforms in access to education, universal health insurance in the form of a little green Medicare card, and he was the man who gave Australians superannuation, which was a word that was not spoken in households like mine. It was a concept not understood by many Australians, and it has transformed life in this country for all of us and for the better. The impact of Bob's leadership is truly immeasurable. But at Sydney Opera House, our country lay, played a formal tribute to Hawke and his unifying effect on our country. Another great former leader of the Australian Labor Party, Kim Beazley, was actually able to capture in his speech 
the essence of Bob's contribution. I thought it was a remarkable, remarkable oration uh, by uh, Kim Beasley. But he said at the heart of Bob's ability was his ability to persuade was trust. Most people believed that whether you agreed or not, your happiness was his motive. And that capacity to convey a genuine care for people as the leader of a nation is something we have never seen in my lifetime in any Prime Minister other than Bob Hawke, that ebullience and joy. I do want to reflect on the first time that I, I met Bob Hawke. Uh, unlike Bob, I don't come from a long line of political activists in this country. I'm the daughter of Irish immigrants. And Bob made me feel welcome in a party that I'd only joined a few years before I actually ended up running as a candidate. The very first time I met him was in the lead up to the 2010 election. And as he's done for so many people in our movement, so many people who've stood for parliament, he supported me in fundraising. The first time I met him, I uh, spoke to him as a character really from television. I hadn't even really seen him at Labor Party events in up, up close and personal. I'd seen him at a distance. But he was so warm and friendly immediately. I said to him, you've met my father. And he looked at me and I said, yes, he's argued with you many times through the television. And that's how Australians knew Bob. They could talk to him through a screen because he talked Australian. And he talked in a language that was generous and was a language of care. And it changed the way a conversation was able to happen in this country. Bob was supposed to be there for a short time for this dinner with, many, with uh, several people who were giving me support in my campaign. About three hours later, we were still there having a fantastic conversation. Bob loved people and people loved Bob. But in the course of that evening, uh, Bob pulled out from a small black uh, dossier file that he was carrying two important things. The first was a single page document where he'd summarised some of the key arguments of Joseph Stiglitz, Stiglitz that you know, amazing international economist. And he spoke with intellectual passion and uh, rich understanding, knowledge and reflection about the economic reality facing Australia. He had us all spellbound. A little later in the evening, I spoke to him about the journey of his life to come to be the Prime Minister, to believe that that was a role that he would be able to undertake. And the journey, and we heard from uh, Senator Wong about the strategic decisions that Bob made, to actually determine at some point of time that you're called to Prime Ministership is a remarkable thing. And I asked Bob, what was it? And what moment in your life did you figure out that you could and should be the Prime Minister of Australia? And it's at that moment, something truly remarkable happened that will always be remembered by me and those who are in that room. Bob reached into his little black bag for the second time in the evening and he pulled out a picture of his mother. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know too many people who carry around a little black bag with a speech and summary of key points from Joseph Stiglitz and a picture of your mother beside it. Quite a remarkable thing. And I, I say that because I think there's such power in what Bob's mother did in enabling him to believe that that was part of his destiny. And I wonder how many mothers and fathers across this country uh, can transcend the cynicism that's so powerful in our time that dissuades people from participating in public life. How many mothers and fathers should look at the life of Bob Hawke that we're celebrating today? and see that a great Australian, born into a family anywhere around the country, can think about the contribution to the national good, can think about becoming a prime minister as a public good, as a benefit, as a great way to live your life and make a contribution. And certainly that belief in himself to do that job that his mother engendered is part of the journey of all of those people who formed the man who became our prime minister, Bob Hawke. Bob cared not just about the economy, but as the economy is part of society. And it's an economy that's concerned with the opportunities available to all Australians. As a former teacher myself, I've spent much of my professional life in classrooms and lecture theatres across this great country. 
And I've seen firsthand the transformative power of education and its capacity to uh, be a great equaliser. Bob had an acute awareness of the impact of a good education on one's ability to fulfil their potential, and he knew that this was something that was vital to help shape our clever country. We know that the three, of he, uh, the three in ten kids finishing school that was the reality before Bob became Prime Minister, had turned into eight in ten children finishing year 12 by the time he left his prime ministership. This is a truly remarkable social change to bring about in a period of government. His understanding of the power of education captured best, I think, in his own words, uh, I put in this way. I think that one, of the most, that one of the monstrosities of the Australian society is this fact, and it's an indisputable fact, that the child of a low-income parent, simply because of that fact, that he is the child of a low-income parent in this country, has a significant lesser chance of having the opportunity of an education and going to the institutions which enable him to give full expression to the native talents of which he is possessed. I think it's absolutely unbelievable that at this stage of our um, uh, emergence as a so-called civilised society that we should still be asked to tolerate that situation. Bob's insight, Bob's articulation, Bob's determination to do something about that reality that he so aptly described makes him an amazing Prime Minister just on that one policy area of education. There was an opportunity uh, that I had with other Labor attendees at a national conference to hear Bob speak about his time as Prime Minister. And there were many wonderful things to take from it, but one of the stories that he conveyed was his practice on a Sunday afternoon of reading his papers very carefully for the Cabinet. And uh, He conveyed the story about one Sunday afternoon reading through reams and reams of documentation about Antarctica. And he got to a line in it and said that there was going. He, he, it indicated there would be mining approved in Antarctica. And Bob's reaction, as he was recounting these stories, was he said, "I read that line. I read it once. Couldn't believe it. I read it twice. And I thought, well, that's not going to happen when I'm the prime minister. While I'm the prime minister, that will never happen. And that dedication to actually doing the work, reading the brief carefully, and then, in addition to that, determining that he would take a course of action." that would transform forever what's going on in Antarctica, to preserve that. It was the will and good hard work of one man who then went about it deliberately, making sure that that capacity for mining in Antarctica did not happen. The power of one good man or one good woman, that is what Bob can teach us with his life. In this time of difficulty for our great party, it's important to remember that things weren't always easy for Bob either. All of us here in the 46th parliament today have been blessed with the gift and the responsibility of representing people across this great land. As a party, we know that we will continue doing what is right in Bob's memory. Bob and his capable team didn't always choose what was easy. In fact, the the course that they charted was often difficult. We can go forward in solidarity with Bob as our guiding light. I worry, though, perhaps on some days like this, we turn men with feet of clay into saints. And I think the last thing Bob Hawke would want to be recalled as is, is a saint. We should remember that he was an ordinary Australian who went to school like us, who lived in this community, in this great country like us. There is no political messiah out there waiting for any party. People who are going to come to politics are people like us, flawed but perhaps with a great vision and certainly with a great capacity to tell a story that will lift us. And that is exactly who, who Bob was. I want to close with these final words from Bill Kelty and his contribution at the memorial to Bob Hawke in the amazing Opera House building. I want to acknowledge what a fine celebration of a great life that was, to thank the musicians for the way they lifted our spirit, and to note for those who didn't see it and didn't hear that uh, it was that wonderful Men at Work song, I Come From a Land Down Under, that finished us in a rousing way, 
a popular song, complex song, transformed by the way it was played by the orchestra on that day. Bill Kelty said these words, though. Bob was no saint. Bob had his faults, but he did a power of good for this country, a power of good for us all. He made the country and helped make the country what it is. And he made and he made a, a part and he made a part for his making this country play a better part in the world the rest of the world. So Vale, Bob Hawke, uh, may he rest in peace and I acknowledge his amazing contribution to this great nation. I feel so privileged as an Australian to have met him and to be part of the tradition that he served. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Madam Deputy President. Today uh, we farewell one of the nation's greatest leaders, Bob Hawke, and many of the contributions that have been made uh, today in this place. Um, I obviously want to associate myself with, um, and I think it's an amazing testament to this man's life that whatever side of the political spectrum you come from, you can recognise uh, and must be able to see the true leadership that Bob, ha Bob Hawke gave our nation, um, not just when he was Prime Minister, uh, but also continued well beyond. Bob was a man who was relatable as he was visionary. I remember being six or seven year old and living in country Victoria and deciding that I was going to write uh, to our Prime Minister, that I was going to write to Bob Hawke. And the reason why, as a young girl, I felt empowered to do this was because the Prime Minister that I knew was somebody who listened that engaged with the community, that sought to be part of everybody's everyday Australia. I didn't think it was weird that as a six or seven year old I would take pen to paper and write to my Prime Minister. I wrote to him about wanting to save the Victorian forests. I lived in country Victoria and it was a raging debate and I wanted him to know how important the forests were to me and my family. To be honest, I don't know if I ever got a response. I don't recall that. Um, but I do remember distinctly sitting down, writing that letter, and then proudly telling my dad that I was going to go and post it. Prime Minister Hawke is remembered for many things. Among them, his thoughtfulness on the great human rights challenges of his time. He successfully lobbied the Commonwealth to change tactics to pressure the apartheid in South Africa. Trade sanctions weren't working, so he called for a boycott of foreign investments. A big call, a big decision to make. But it was critical in dismantling the apartheid regime. And of course, we cannot forget the actions that Prime Minister Hawke took in the wake of Tiananmen Square and the massacre that occurred there. Prime Minister Hawke defied advice and convention to speak from the heart about what had just happened in the wake of the massacre. And it wasn't just rhetoric. His actions resulted in 40,000 Chinese being able to stay here in Australia and making this their home. Reflecting on those decisions years later, Bob said, it's called leadership. I had no consultation with anyone, and I walked off the diocese, and I was told, quote, you can't do that, Prime Minister. I said, I said to them, I just did, and it's done. And that's leadership. He knew what was right, and he acted. This is a lesson for all of us. His moral and human leadership defined him. His ability to show strength, yet empathy and compassion. That's what made Bob Hawke a unique leader in this country. And in a time of unrest in our region, the lessons that he shows us are lessons we must heed now, more than ever before. 
I was thinking about the Tiananmen Square decision and his ability to act with conviction, with strength, and yet compassion and empathy. And it's of course been 30 years since the Tiananmen Square massacre. Only in the last month we've acknowledged the 30th anniversary. And for those watching the television news last night, the images of what's coming out of Hong Kong right now, and not one word seems to be uttered by our current government. Very little is being said by politicians here in Australia. I was thinking when I was sitting here listening to the other contributions earlier this morning, what would Bob Hawke do? Would he simply sit back and stay silent, seeing the rise and cry for democracy in Hong Kong? I don't think he would. I think he would stand up. He'd acknowledge that struggle. <coughs> He'd be diplomatic, of course, but he would not shy away from the right of the Hong Kong citizens to call for and fight for their democratic rights. The leadership from Bob Hawke on these moral and ethical challenges is something I think we all need to reflect on in the wake of his death. I attended the memorial in Sydney, along with many of my colleagues in this place, only a few weeks ago. And it was an amazing celebration of Bob Hawke's life. But it was more than that. It was an amazing celebration of our nation, what makes our country great. Bob loved Australia. He loved Australians. He showed that you could lead with strength and heart, both at the same time. As I sat in the memorial, I was struck by the words of his granddaughter, Sophie Taylor Price. And in 1989, 30 years ago, she sat on his knee while he gave a national television address. It was to commemorate World Environment Day. And he said in that nationally televised address, we don't inherit the planet, we borrow it. Not simply for ourselves, but for our kids and their kids, like Sophie here, referring to his granddaughter how successfully she and other Australian children can fulfil their goals depends on how we look after our environment and how we best use this planet and its natural resources. This was 30 years ago, and Bob Hawke, as Prime Minister, was asking us to think much more cleverly and clearly about how we think about our natural world and the resources it offers. Bob Hawke didn't just talk the talk, he walked it. And we know that there is a long list of special, precious places here in Australia that have been saved and protected because of the leadership of Prime Minister Hawke. In the days after his death, former Greens leader Bob Brown penned a heartfelt and genuinely sad but celebratory opinion piece, a reflection of how Bob had experienced working with and during the time of Bob Hawke's leadership, sometimes his ally and sometimes his adversary. Bob Brown wrote, a hawk masterstroke was to accept the proposal of the Australian Conservation Foundation's Philip 
Tone and the National Farmers Federation, Rick Farley, to set up Landcare. This became a beacon of global interest in government-funded repair of rural lands and rivers. That land care and general environment spending has been gutted in recent years highlights the loss of vision in Canberra since the great environmental innovation era Hawke ushered in. Bob continues, key to Hawke's environmental success was his listening ear. He knew the Australian public was keen on protecting nature and made himself open to direct liaison with environmental leaders. He was a tough negotiator, but he and his staff opened an ear to the environment. Bob Brown reflects on not only was it Bob Hawke's leadership as Prime Minister, but the decisions he made about who he involved in his cabinet. And one of the most impressive, <coughs> hardened, deliberate, conviction environment ministers this country has ever seen was Graham Richardson, under the leadership of Bob Hawke. Graham and Bob knew that if they were to save special parts of the Australian landscape to send a message that protecting the environment was important. They had to listen to the community. But the advice that Bob Hawke and Graham Richardson gave the environment movement at that time was that you must roar. The crowd must roar for us to be able to act. And I think in the wake of this past election and this time of reflection, those words are now more important than ever. Those across this country who care deeply about our natural environment, about what our planet looks like in years to come, about the future of our children, being despondent is not the answer. Standing up, speaking out and hearing you roar, your voice, your compassion, your love for your country. Bob Hawke called our community to do that when he was Prime Minister. And we need people to do it now. If you care about saving our country's greatest river network, the Murray-Darling Basin, if you care about protecting the Great Australian Bight, if you want the Great Barrier Reef to be there for your grandchildren, we need to hear you roar. Don't be despondent. Don't be depressed. Stand up and demand the type of leadership that Bob Hawke had. You can be both strong and compassionate and believe in the beauty and the strength of this nation all at once. No one would doubt Bob Hawke's love for Australia, for its people and its environment. And he wore that love with pride. I think, upon reflection of the great leadership from Bob Hawke, wearing that love of our country with pride is what we could all take on to honour his legacy. The moral leadership, the conviction, doing what is right because it's right, not because it's easy, making those decisions to speak up for fellow human beings. 
but taking the decision to protect this world for the next generation. That's the legacy. That's the legacy that I know myself, my generation, and many others in this place will continue as we reflect on the life of Bob Hawke, Vale Bob Hawke. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Dean Smith. Madam Deputy President, I also rise uh, this morning to make a con contribution on the condolence motion on the death of former Prime Minister Robert James Lee Hawke, AC. And before beginning, I extend my congratulations to you uh, on your election as Deputy President and Chairman of Committees. Thank you. Bob Hawke was born in Bordertown, New South Australia, yet no one really thinks of Bob Hawke as a South Australian. He went to school and university in Western Australia, yet no one really thinks about Bob Hawke as a West Australian. He lived, worked and represented an electorate in Victoria, yet no one talks about Bob Hawke as a Victorian. And he spent his political life, his post-political life, living in Sydney, yet no one really thinks of Bob Hawke as a New South Welshman. Bob Hawke was an Australian. That's what mattered. That's how people saw him. That's how he'll be remembered. And that was the characteristic he most wanted for himself. On the evening of December 19, 1991, at a press conference in this very building, just after he lost the Labor leadership and thus saw his almost nine years as Prime Minister come to an end, Hawke was asked how he wanted to be remembered. He said, I guess as a bloke who loved his country and still does, and loves Australians, and who was not essentially changed by high office. He said, I hope they'll still think of me as the Bob Hawke that they got to know, the Larrikin trade union leader who perhaps had sufficient common sense and intelligence to tone down his Larrikinism to some extent and behave in a way that a Prime Minister should if he's going to be a proper representative of the people, but who in the end is essentially a dinky die Australian. If the contributions in this place thus far and the extensive coverage of Bob Hawke's passing are anything to go by, it's fair to say that the former Prime Minister achieved his wish. There is no one correct answer to the question of what Bob Hawke's most significant achievement was in policy terms. But one of the most important lessons he taught us is one that, especially in our present political era, era we need to sincerely pause and reflect upon. Bob Hawke was authentic. He didn't pretend to be faultless. He was candid about his vulnerabilities and his imperfections. If there's any lesson to be drawn from his time on the political stage, surely it is that perfection is not a precondition for greatness. In a political age where an entire week can be consumed by something someone put on Twitter years ago, and we in Parliament and those in the media tie themselves up in knots, wondering whether someone meets some arbitrary character test, it's worth asking ourselves whether the quality of our politics is being enhanced by such an approach. Suppose Bob Hawke had been a candidate for the first time in 2019, rather than in 1963 when he first ran for Carraro, or when he initially won his seat of Wills in 1980. Would his past transgressions have ruled him out of contention? Almost certainly. Would Australia have been poorer as a result? Most definitely. I say that as someone who has been a lifelong Liberal and campaigned actively as a young person on the ground in Perth to defeat the Hawke government in the late 1980s. Like others in this place, I also owe my journey, my interest in politics, to Bob Hawke. Surprisingly, like Senator Hanson Young, I also wrote to the Prime Minister as a young teenager uh, requesting the most simplest of things, a campaign sticker. You can imagine my delight when I got home from school to receive an envelope marked with the office of Prime Minister. To open it, there was a simple letter saying, Dear Dean, please find enclosed a campaign sticker. And it was the campaign sticker from the 1983 federal election campaign bringing Australians together. 
Indeed, in my first speech, I reflected on the general political approach taken by the Hawke Labor government and the WA Labor government of Brian Burke at the time, and how it made me feel deeply uncomfortable, and how this sparked a political interest and fervour in me and forcing me to consider deeply my own political values and approach. In that first speech, I said that I had been appalled by Labor's cosy menage a trois of big business, big government, big unions, willfully taking ordinary families like mine and those around me for granted. Seven years later, that continues to inform my own approach to political issues. When I hear phrases like, there is a consensus or there is overwhelming agreement about something, I'm instinctively drawn to look deeper into the issue and to start from a position of suspicion. But moments like this morning give us an opportunity to stop and reflect. One of the more unfortunate developments in Australian politics over the past decade has been an unwillingness on both sides to acknowledge when our opponents have been right about things. As the saying goes, even a broken clock is, tw is correct twice a day. To oppose for the sake of opposing, for every single battle to be fought along tribal lines, leaving no room for nuance. As the 46th Parliament commenced this week, perhaps one of the ways we can all honour Bob Hawke's memory is to call time on this tired approach. That doesn't mean we should agree on everything. If we have honest disagreements, we should prosecute them fully and energetically. Australians are entitled to expect that. But they are equally entitled to policy consistency. That also means being prepared to acknowledge when our political opponents have got something right in policy terms. In the wake of Bob Hawke's passing, there was much coverage <coughs> of the economic reforms he achieved in partisanship with poor heating during the 1980s and into the earlier part of the 1990s, the floating of the dollar, tax reform, opening up the banking sector to competition, privatisation of some government-owned businesses and tariff reductions, to name a few. All of these reforms were noted as being essential to the establishment of what we now call modern Australia. What they mean, of course, by the term modern Australia is an economy that is more outward-looking more economically integrated with the Asian region, less reliant on protectionist trade barriers, less enamoured of centralised wage fixing and more open to competition. At the time many of these things were undertaken 35 years ago, it was possible to find serious opposition to these propositions. Some of the fierce were in Bob Hawke's own caucus room. But to their credit, Bob Hawke and Paul Keating pushed through and did not in any way resile because they had a powerful belief, a powerful conviction in what they were doing and their view that it was the right thing to do. I think it's also worth pointing out that they also had another significant ally in many of these undertakings, namely their partisan opponents and particularly John Howard, who was shadow treasurer and then later opposition leader when Bob Hawke undertook the most audacious aspects of his economic reform agenda. It's one thing to claim three decades after the fact that certain economic reforms were obvious or inevitable. It's, e it's an easy analysis, but it's also a shallow one. It's my observation that what matters most, and I think that what history will judge, is the attitude political parties take, not in a point of time, but over time. John Howard, for the most part, supported the signature reforms that the Hawke Labor government undertook. Why? Because he could see they were consistent with what was in Australia's long-term interests. When John Howard was Prime Minister a decade later and was pursuing further economic reforms, particularly in relation to his first round of industrial relations changes and tax reform and the introduction of the GST, it's worth recalling that that bipartisanship was not returned. There is a reason why Bob Hawke and John, Hell, John Howard held each other in such high regard and why history will ultimately be kind to both gentlemen. They were both able to resist the temptation to do the easy thing politically and instead remain steadfast in pursuing economic reforms they believed to be right, a belief that both history and Australia's economic performance over the last three decades has clearly vindicated. Both also recognise that political capital is a precious commodity that does not last forever, something that some of their successes in high office over the past decade have perhaps not been as skilled at recognising. I don't make these observations a means, as a means of litigating past battles, but rather because we are at the beginning of a new parliament 
and I think there's an opportunity to recapture some of the more rational approach to politics that characterised the Hawke era. A rational approach I don't believe is necessarily beyond our reach. The common lesson of Hawke and Howard, and reflected in the outcome of the most recent ballot just a few months ago, is that Australians want and will reward their leaders when they are focused on the issues that matter to them. We should also acknowledge that this great Australian, Larrikin, possessed, I think, one of the greatest of political gifts, and that is of grace. Because as we all know, Mr Hawke ultimately ceased to be Prime Minister not because he was defeated at an election, but because he was removed from the leadership by his own colleagues. Politics is a very brutal business. Most of, it, most of us in this place do not get to be here without having some experience of setbacks and defeat. And most of us here will not ultimately get to choose the precise timing or manner of our own departure. That good fortune will fall to just a few. I cannot imagine how personally hurtful it would have been for Bob Hawke to lose the job he loved at the hands of a party that he'd taken to four successive election victories, a feat equalled only by Menzies and by John Howard. However, the measure of an individual is how they deal with such a setback. No one is really ever immune from the very real and serious temptations to lash out or to settle scores. But to his enormous credit, that was something that Bob Hawke was not characterised by. Of course, he published a memoir and participated in a television documentary where he made some blunt observations regarding his successor. And I think that is totally defensible. A former leader is always entitled to offer their perspective on their period in office. But that is a very different thing from waging a protracted campaign of vengeance. It's certainly very different from engaging behaviour designed to damage your own political party in the context of a federal election campaign. Of course, Bob Hawke was on the public stage in a pre-Twitter era, but even so, it's difficult to envisage him weaponising social media as a means of damaging the political party to which he owed his entire public career. In fact, there is footage of Bob Hawke on the election night in 1993 sharing his joy at Labor's victory. When the Labor Party gathered in the Great Hall of this building for a dinner to celebrate that famous victory for the true believers, a few weeks later, Bob Hawke was present to hear the man who replaced him say, just let me say this, you can't have a fifth election victory without a fourth, and the bloke that gave it to us is here tonight Thanks for coming, Bob. And that generosity of spirit was returned just a couple of weeks ago during Bob Hawke's memorial at the Sydney Opera House, when at Hawke's own request, one of the eulogies was delivered by Paul Keating, the man who had torn him down. Indeed, one of the most remarkable things that I found in the course of reading about some of the events during the Hawke-Keating leadership tussle is that on the very day Keating had declared his first unsuccessful challenge in June of 1991, he and Hawke had spent the whole day in the same room presiding over a Premier's conference as Prime Minister and Treasurer. There's a degree to which time heals all wounds, there's no doubt. But I think more than that, these moments show an ability to put personal ambition aside and work in the national interest that now seems unimaginable. But if it is unimaginable, that is only because we, the politicians, have made it so. The experience of the past decade in Australian politics notwithstanding, mm -hmm. I like to think it possible we will see such cooperation again in the not too distant future. There's no doubt that Menzies, Hawke and Howard are the three giants of post-war politics in our country. They were from very different backgrounds and are very different people. Of course, each of them was possessed by an enormous ambition, energy and drive, a prerequisite in politics. But perhaps what sets these three apart is that their ambition went beyond merely securing their own personal advancement, and that was something that fellow Australians could sense and see. For, more than, for far more than other Prime Ministers, something within this three has managed to capture the public mood permitting them to sustain public support through successive elections in a way others have not been able to match. The ability to appeal to so many of your fellow Australians over a such, long, such a long period of time is a remarkable thing. No one factor can explain it. 
But perhaps the one element to all three was that they were authentic, true to themselves, to their beliefs, and had a clear set of values. That consistency is what enabled them to develop a bond with the public capable of withstanding the day-to-day -day vicissitudes that accompany political life. Bob Hawke was said to have had a love affair with the Australian people, but his political legacy goes far beyond anything that can be measured by opinion polls and election results. He forced his own party to fundamentally rethink its approach to economic management, pursued essential economic reforms that previous Liberal governments had been too timid to touch, and even though he left the stage reluctantly, he nonetheless did it in a manner that was graceful, dignified and protected the interests of the political party to which he had devoted his whole life. Bob Hawke will always remain a Labor Party icon. But even those of us who have never voted for him should be proud of the manner in which he conducted his prime ministership and the fundamental decency he displayed towards political friend and political foe alike. The best tribute those of us serving as parliamentarians today can pay to Bob Hawke is to work harder to emulate the positive, principled and generous spirit he brought to his many years in public life. Robert James Lee Hawke, AC, may you rest in peace. Senator Kitchen. Thank you, Chair. Growing up, I watched Bob Hawke with wonder. He was a star of the screen and felt like part of every Australian family in the 1980s. I distinctly remember watching the 7 o'clock news and seeing him and Paul Keating at the Economic Summit in 1983, which led me to following that summit's progress and its effects obsessively. Later in life, at countless Labor gatherings, he always made such an effort to attend, and even as he got less physically mobile, I met with him many times. He was Labor's rock star, who'd pull the biggest crowds and even in advancing years would give passionate, persuasive, powerful speeches that left in those in attendance walking on air. He roared with laughter when I told him that I'd been counted off in a ballot for, for an ALP Victorian branch party president's position despite receiving the votes to be elected because none of the male candidates received enough votes and that the party's affirmative action rule meant we had to choose at least one man. A token man, Bob laughed. Bob had, of course, championed the cause of women in our party and movement long before it was fashionable. But he was a charmer. He would often notice shoes and express his approval for daring choices. He told me that he firmly believed that women who wore daring shoes led interesting lives. He had been a close friend and ally of my father-in-law, Bill Landeu, of blessed memory, who passed away a couple of months ago. Bill told me many war stories about his adventures with Bob, and it was clear that his role in Bob's ascension gave him a sense of great satisfaction and achievement. And that was so much a part of Bob's magic his love affair with the Australian people, that we all felt like we were part of him, part of his great journey and his amazing life. He was the greatest post-war Prime Minister we've had. He and Paul Keating opened up the economy in a bold way, in an unprecedented partnership with unions, created Medicare, drove record numbers of Australians to finish secondary school and go to university, gave all Australians compulsory superannuation, fought the good fight to protect our beautiful environment and had zero tolerance for racism and extremism. We look back on most of these things and they seem obvious or even easy. The truth is that all of those big changes required great political skill and the very best of leadership. And fortunately for Australia, Bob Hawke was the very best. I want to mention a few incidents in Bob Hawke's career that highlight what I think was one of his defining characteristics, and that is his political courage. I think this is important because it contradicts the common view that Hawke was merely a likeable, easy-going bloke who cultivated his popularity while Paul Keating and John Button did all the hard work. That is far from the truth. The first episode was Hawke's determination to reform the Victorian branch of the Labor Party which after the 1955 split was left in the hands of a narrowly based factional junta. 
It was Victorian Labor's organisational and political weakness that allowed the Liberals under Bolte and Hamer 27 years in office. And it was the failure to win any federal seats in Victoria that cost Labor the 1961 election. So, in 1971, Hawke as ACTU president was the key figure in backing Gough Whitlam's intervention in the Victorian branch. Whitlam provided the leadership, but Hawke delivered the numbers and the support of the key unions. He did this in the face of fierce opposition from supporters of the factional regime in Victoria. The result was a rapid improvement in Victorian Labor's fortunes, both state and federally. In 1985, Hawke used this, his influence as Prime Minister to complete this work by bringing the so-called grouper unions, notably the shop assistants and the federated clerks, back into the Labor Party 30 years after the split. Again, he did this in the face of intense hostility, including the no notorious incident when tomatoes were thrown at a state conference. My father-in-law indeed remembered coming home uh, with his suit jacket on, but the sleeves had been torn off. Hawke's efforts brought, brought a large section of Catholic voters in Victoria back to Labor. It is no coincidence that our two recent successful premiers, Steve Brax and Daniel Andrews, come from Catholic families. The second episode I want to mention is the 1988 airline pilot strike. Under the accord between the Hawke government and the ACTU, the unions accepted restraint in the pursuit of higher wages which only fuelled inflation in exchange for greatly increased spending on the social wage, improvement in schools, the Medicare scheme and na national superannuation. The Airline Pilots Union, a small non-ACTU union representing some of the highest paid employees in Australia, tried to break this agreement with a rogue strike. Hawke ruthlessly crushed them by bringing in the RAF to carry passengers. Breaking a strike violated one of the most sacred taboos in the labour movement, and horrified even some of Hawke's union supporters. But he was willing to do it for the greater good of Australian workers as a whole. The third episode I want to mention is Hawke's response to the Tiananmen Square massacre in Beijing in 1989. Hawke had worked hard to build a good relationship with the Chinese leaders and reacted angrily to their murderous assault on peaceful demonstrators. His decision to allow over 40,000 Chinese students and others to stay in Australia was his alone, unilateral and spontaneous. He later recalled, I was told, you cannot do that, Prime Minister. I said to them, I just did. It is done. His decision was a courageous one a year before the 1990 election, at a time when Australian immigration was still a politically dangerous subject. Fourthly, I want to mention Hawke's resolute com commitment to the Australia-US alliance. I do so because I think this is particularly relevant to us today. President Reagan's arms build-up was, to put it mildly, not popular on the progressive side of Australian politics. Remember, many wanted to follow New Zealand's lead and withdraw from the ANZUS alliance and evict the US from joint facilities, such as Pine Gap. Hawke refused to consider this and instead built a very good relationship with Ronald Reagan. In 1991, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, Hawke was the first Allied leader to commit support to President Bush's determination to use force against Iraq. Again, he faced down fierce hostility on this position. The lesson for us is that our security alliance with the US is more important than what we think of, in, of any one president. Prime ministers and presidents come and go, but our security interests do not change. I also want to mention Bob Hawke's close relationship with, the Austra with Australia's Jewish community and his emotional support for the State of Israel. This has already been mentioned by Senator Cormann. Among, closest, as, as, among Hawke's closest friends was Lionel Revelman, his partner in the ACTU Burke's stored venture, Sir Peter Abels and Saul Sane. And in fact, uh, I've spent many a pleasant summer January evening on the Sane's tennis court with Bob Hawke uh, at a function they typically have uh, in uh, late January. Bob Hawke also counted Golda Meir and Yitzhak Rabin as friends. After the 1973 Yom Kippur War, he warned, if the bell tolls for Israel, it won't just toll for Israel, it will toll for all mankind. 
He was also a strong supporter of the Jewish refuseniks in the Soviet Union. He even went to Moscow to try to persuade the Soviet leaders to relent on Jewish emigration. These positions earned him death threats at the time. After his retirement, Hawke continued his support, and he did call for a two-state solution as the only way to end the conflict. To more recent times, it was a sad coincidence that Bob Hawke's death came just two days before our defeat in the 18 May election. Despite the passionate desire of everyone in the Labor Party to do it for Bob, we were unable to deliver the victory he would have loved to see. After every election loss, there must come a time of questioning and reassessment, and that's what we're going through at the present. And we owe it to Bob Hawke to do that, and also to the millions of Australians who look to Labor governments to improve the quality of their life, lives, just as Bob Hawke's government did. We also need to recognise, as Bob Hawke did, that Labor's electoral su success has never rested on unionised working class alone. One of the reasons Bob Hawke supported reform of the Victorian ALP in the 1970s was that the, so that the great Melbourne middle class would again be willing to vote Labor, which they increasingly did from 1972 onwards. The great victories of Kane, Brax and Andrews could not have come from working class votes alone. Winning a federal election also requires support from a broad spectrum of Australians, not just working class voters. Further to this, a 2015 ANU study found that 52 per cent of Australians identified as middle class, and this figure is even higher among young voters. Bridging the gap between working class and middle class Australians, between inner city, suburban and regional Australians, between different ethnic and religious communities, and assembling a winning coalition of voters across classes, regions and identities requires three things. It requires soundly based policy, it requires inspirational leadership, and it requires consistent and effective messaging. Clearly, Bob Hawke was a master of all three of these. His leadership inspired confidence and trust. He knew how to communicate with the Australian people, and he was able to persuade a majority of voters to support his policies. Every time I am in the Labor caucus room in Canberra and gaze upon his smiling face, I will remind myself of the example he set, to work as hard and as passionately as he did, to try to think and communicate, communicate as clearly as he did, to act as bravely and inclusively as he did in the service of the nation he loved so dearly. My condolences go to Blanche, to his children and grandchildren. They can be very proud of him. We all are. Vale Bob Hawke. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. I also want to contribute to this con um, condolence motion and to remember Bob Hawke. I want to pass my sympathies on to his family to begin with, to Blanche, to his children Sue, Rosalind and Stephen and their children, Bob Hawke's grandchildren. Hawke was a public figure throughout has been a public figure throughout my life. I grew up with Bob Hawke basically there on the television from pretty much early as, as early as I could remember when he was ACTU president. So this craggy faced black and white figure is what I remember and being so powerful and outspoken speaking up for workers. And then of course from there becoming an MP in 1980 then the opposition leader and finally prime minister in 1983. There have been a lot of words that have already been spoken today about the broad range of achievements and the things that we remember Bob Hawke for, but I want to focus on one in particular, and that's his contribution towards our environment, and particularly his contribution towards protecting the Franklin River in southwest Tasmania. And I think if you look at that campaign, we need to remember how huge that campaign to protect the Franklin was and how significant and important Hawke's position to be protecting the river was, both for the protection of the river as it was, but as an iconic and iconic, symbolic and movement shaking, shaping moment in terms of protection of natural heritage here in Australia and indeed around the world. 
And also, if you think of Hawke having been elected in 1983, the importance of that Franklin campaign in Labor winning that 1983 um, election. The Franklin campaign began when the announcement was made by the Tasmanian government that was going to dam the Franklin River, or dam the, the Gordon above Franklin, in 1978. And for me, it was when I was just leaving school. I began uni in 1979, and it shaped me like it shaped so many other people. The campaign grew and grew and grew, and for a long time there was not political support. We had already seen uh, many hydroelectric uh, electricity schemes in Tasmania. Many bits of the southwest Tasmanian wilderness had been lost to, to large dams. But this was the one, and, and then there was the, the damming of Lake Pedda, which of course was such a massive loss in terms of, of, of natural heritage. So the campaign to protect the Franklin began, and it began to grow, it began to swell. Fairly early on, there was the support of the Australian Democrats, right from their formation. But in terms of the Labor and Liberal parties, resolutely at the beginning of, of the campaign, they were pro the damming of the river. And so then the campaign grew, drew people from around the world, drew people certainly from across Australia, drew people from all backgrounds, all walks of life, from ordinary people through to celebrities, and people who knew the importance of protecting our natural world, our inspirational wild landscapes, our precious animals and birds, and how, what a travesty it would be to see them lost for 180 megawatts of power. And they were people who banded together for a better, a cleaner future. They campaigned together and they built a movement. So during this time, between 1979 and then 1983, as I said, the political support initially from the Labor and Liberal parties just wasn't there. But then things started to shift. And there was the divisions within the Labor Party. There were those that were pro-dam. There were those that were anti-dam. There were the different positions that different states took <coughs> and, and different positions of, of the Labor Party in different states. Now, even the Liberal Party, by the time of, the, of 1983, we had Malcolm Fraser as Prime Minister offering um, considerable compensation to the Tasmanian government to not build the dam, which was then rejected. And what that meant <coughs> was that there wasn't a clear political um, voice. There wasn't the translation of that movement, that groundswell, into our political sphere um, with any power until Bob Hawke. So Bob becoming a member of parliament in 1980 and then opposition leader, of course he became opposition leader on the um, 3rd of February um, 1983, the very day that the, the, um, that the election was called. But Bob came to that position with a, posi with a personal position of protection for the Franklin. And that had been his position at a Labor Party conference four months earlier, when his, the, the person he succeeded, Bill Hayden, had been pro-dam. Bob was pro the river. And Labor changed their position at that conference to being um, in favour of saving the, liver, the river. And Bob's position of being pro-river was instrumental in that. But it wasn't until he then became opposition leader, and then in that election campaign, on the third, beginning on the 3rd of February 1983, that there then was a clear political outlet for that movement. We had been, we had, you know, had Australian Democrat senators here in this parliament who had been campaigning the Franklin, who did not have the power to protect the, the river on their own. We needed the support of one of the major parties, and it wasn't until Bob was elected as, as opposition leader and going into that election campaign that the environment movement then knew that they could wholeheartedly get behind supporting the Labor Party in that election campaign. And they did, and I was part of that. And that massive campaign and the, the translation of that huge movement that, had, that really did cross all of Australia to then be able to focus that and say, well, if we're going to protect the Franklin River, we need to vote Labor. 
So I was proudly a Labor voter at that 1983 election. It was a, you know, a landslide victory. And so I think the courageous leadership that was shown um, was so significant in, in taking that stand and then enabling that translation of all of that campaigning into power here into, in our parliaments. And it meant that you know, Labor could be seen as speaking unequivocally, not sitting on the fence, that they could be seen as, being the, as doing what was right to be protecting not just that one precious bit of wilderness, but to be sending a sign that these environment issues, that our precious animals and birds, that our precious native, native natural places need to be protected in their own right. And so when, then when the, the Hawke government was elected in, 1980, in March 1983, the Franklin campaign was won. We then did have a battle, you know, it was taken to the High Court, but because of the World Heritage listing that had been previously put in place, that High Court decision meant that the Franklin was won. And it was a, such a powerful moment for so many people. It was certainly pivotal to me because in that time, 1979 to 1983, being increasingly involved in environment campaigns and also having learnt about climate change, that factor of having part, been part of a campaign that was a massive movement of people fighting for what was right and then winning was pivotal. And Bob Hawke was central to that winning. And it was enough for me. I mean, it was a, a pivotal moment that you know, was led to my journey to being in this place because it then led to me being an environment campaigner. And then an environment campaigner employed in the environment movement, my time as, a, as somebody working in the environment movement almost perfectly coincided with Bob Hawke's time as Prime Minister. And so I was there at the time when he led a government that was the most pro-environment government in Australia's history. But once again, the achievements that were there were through Hawke, as the Labor leader and as Prime Minister, being a reflection of the movement in the community, listening to the people in the community who wanted to see, who knew the importance of seeing protection for our, our precious natural places. So, you know, the list of places that were protected during the Hawke governments, Kakadu, Daintree, the, the protection of the Antarctic, the protection of rainforests, Uluru Katajuta, Shark Bay, but they were all on the back of big campaigns, of the community banding together, of roaring, of needing support, but knowing that there was actually people that were listening here in Canberra. And of course, we didn't get everything that we wanted. Each one of those campaigns was still hard fought, but at least we knew that there was actually a potential of getting the change and a potential of getting, getting good outcomes if people roared, roared loudly, loudly enough. It was also the time that, you know, here it's almost incredible to believe when we're still having these debates about our climate crisis, the initial beginnings of action from the Australian government. Now, I remember in particular sort of the Greenhouse 88 conference that was supported federally that was actually laying on the table what needed to, be, to happen to be tackling our climate crisis. As I said, you know, with Hawke as Prime Minister, we still didn't get everything that we wanted. And for me, during that time, I was campaigning on, on forest protection. And right up until the, the end of my time working as a, as a forest campaigner, it's the 1990 election. And that 1990 election with Hawke and with Graham Richardson as the Environment Minister was um, portrayed as an election that this was the election for the environment. In fact, they used the iconic um, Franklin River poster, as the Labor Party used that as their election material for that election. I was working on protecting a skip sands forest, which, despite all of those environmental winds that I mentioned, we were still having to fight really hard to try and get protection for some of the most magnificent forests in the country. And we, did, we had protest actions in the forests that we knew in the lead up to the election were likely to um, result in some interest from the federal, from the federal Labor government who didn't want this um, conflict 
at the time of, sort of a lead up to the election that was meant to be all about how good the Labor Party were at protecting the environment. So pretty quickly we found ourselves in negotiations with um, Graham Richardson's office, and I, I know that sort of with Bob Hawke's office in, in close, listening very closely to see what could be done to actually get us to no longer be protesting in the forests in East Gippsland in, that, in the lead up to that election. And we reached a deal that basically said, well, all right, we will stop protesting as long as post-election there's a genuine pro process to determine whether it was appropriate to log those forests. It was enough of a deal that, for me as a campaigner, I was happy to say, OK, we will step aside, we'll stop the protest actions. And then the election came and went. And very sadly, that deal that I thought we had actually um, fell apart and we did not get the outcome for those forests. Um, that I was expecting, and the, the, the logging of some incredibly precious forests then went ahead post that, 19, um, that 1990 election. That was enough for me to realise that, yes, although we had just experienced this period of time that had the greatest protections for the environment led by Hawke, there was still um, a lot more in terms of some political voice that was needed, and it actually led me to say, well, if we've still got a government that, despite those protections, is still willing to sell out our forests, we actually needed to have people in our parliaments that were even, had those incredibly much even stronger, uncompromised voice for the, for the environment, and it led me to throw myself into being one of the founders of the Greens. But, I think the legacy of Hawke, if you look back now about what was achieved in that period from 1983 through to, to 1993 for him as, as Prime Minister, was extraordinary in terms of those environmental protections. It was leadership that we have not seen since then, that we had not seen up until then, and it's leadership that we desperately need now. I mean, the Franklin River and his support for it was important. It was an iconic campaign. But it was also symbolic and it was an, an, a motivation for environment campaigning around Australia and around the world. It changed the movement and it changed attitudes. But ultimately, it was, only, it was protecting a small part of southwest Tasmania. What we are facing now and the leadership that we need now is to know that we have got an extinction crisis going on, we have a climate crisis going on, which is putting precious natural places all around the world. And all of those precious natural places that, that gained protection during the 1980s are under threat from our climate crisis and from our extinction crisis. These are the challenges that are facing now, and the leadership that Hawke showed in the 80s is what we need now, of people having that political courage to stand up for the protection of our precious natural, natural crisis, our precious natural world, because these are existential crises that the world is now facing. So, what better way to remember Bob Hawke than to remember that leadership that he showed on the environment, and for us as parliamentarians to be taking a similar stand and to say there are precious places that are under threat. There are precious, precious places that need protecting and that take the action to be dealing with our climate crisis, take the action that is necessary to have the political courage not to prevaricate, not to sit on the fence, not to say, oh, well, there are short-term economic benefits to some powerful people in our society and so they are going to prevail. That is selling out. That's not the sort of leadership we, now, we need now. The leadership that I think the memory of Bob Hawke means that we need to show now is to be taking the actions that are necessary, to be transitioning out of coal and gas and oil, to be doing it in a way that protects workers, that protects that ordinary people, but to be having the courage to take that action. And in my memory of Bob Hawke, I hope that my memory of Bob Hawke and what I think the legacy of Bob Hawke needs to be is to remind ourselves to take that action and to be moving forward from here and to be continuing the protection then of those precious places that he was so pivotal in saving. Thank you. Senator Zaccone. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This is not my first speech. In rising today, I wish to share my condolences on the death of Australia's 23rd Prime Minister, Bob Hawke. Much has already been said 
about Hawke since his death in May. We have all shared his life stories, his place in Australian history and his influence on our national identity. This is hardly a surprise. Hawke is a giant of our nation and he made an enormous impression on so many of us. Hawke's contribution to Australia is hard to overstate. Medicare, the Franklin River, the Accord, banning uranium mining, action on workplace gender discrimination, floating the Australian dollar. They are things many people today now take for granted. So deeply ingrained in our community are they. But for families like mine and millions of others, migrants first, second, third generations, his commitment to multiculturalism, welcome and compassion has meant the world. Hawke rejected racism. He rejected division. He refused to allow racial equality to become a political football, recognising the same shared humanity of us all. Even before he entered Parliament, he was leading protests against the Springbok, calling for an end to apartheid in South Africa. He took the work started by Al Grasby and Gough Whitlam in the 1970s and made it his own. When he established the Office for Multicultural Affairs, he situated it within his own portfolio, making his own personal commitment to harmony and welcome clear to all. He wept speaking about the death of protesters in the Tiananmen Square. He was real, he was authentic, not afraid to show that leadership is not just about being loud and strong. His offer of asylum made immediately to Chinese students is a testament to his commitment to human rights. As Barry Cassidy wrote in The Guardian shortly after Hawke's passing, no matter how often he was advised to step really on racism, given the diverse nature of Australia's electorates, he was uncompromising, calling, on it, calling it out whenever he saw it or any hint of it. I'm too young to have voted for Hawke. In fact, I was born in the year he became Prime Minister. When I got involved in the Labor Party, he was a figure of politics past, a piece of living history. But like so many of us, many generations in the party and the Labor movement, I have fond memories of meeting Hawke at a Labor or union function. Surrounded as he was by many activists like me, eager to sit with a figure of inspiration, memories I hope to hold on to for all my life. He was a man of warmth and generosity, friendly to a fault, be it a crowd of young Labor members post-retirement, people of every possible background, children, parents, workers and local constituents. Many people from an enormous range of backgrounds are claiming a special affinity with Hawke. And here too shall I, as a proud Italian, uh, as a proud Australian of Italian heritage. The spirit of Italy seeps into my home city, Melbourne. Our coffee, our restaurants, our spirit of hospitality. And there's no doubt Hawke lived that spirit. It was part of who he was, as well as something he embraced while working with the Italian communities in Coburg, Pascovale and Brunswick and many more. In a report in the Australian newspaper on election day, a member of Hawke's staff described his electoral office. Mr Hawke liked his office to exude all the warmth of an Italian nonna's kitchen, stocked with tea and biscuits, open to all who wanted to pop in. Mimi still remembers drinking cappuccinos with the then Prime Minister at the now closed San Marco restaurant. For my part, there are many wellsprings of inspiration, but Bob Hawke will always large loom in my mind as I work in this place. We should all seek to reject division and racism, 
we should all strive to live up to Bob's legacy of generosity, welcome, compassion and leadership. And today I join my colleagues in this place to offer my sincere condolences to Hawke's family. He'll be deeply missed. Arrivederci, Mr Hawke. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr Acting <coughs> Deputy President. Um, um, I rise to speak uh, on the condolence uh, motion for uh, Robert James Lee Hawke, who was born uh, on the 9th of December 1929 and sadly passed away on the 16th of May this year, just two days before this year's federal election. Uh, looking around the room, uh, <coughs> I suspect I've known Bob Hawke longer than just about uh, all the current senators, and I'd like to share a few anecdotes uh, about uh, his life and my connection uh, and those of my family uh, with it. Uh, Bob Hawke was born in Bordertown in my home state of South Australia. His mother, Edith, <coughs> known as Ellie, was a school teacher, and his father, Arthur, known as Clem, was a Congregationalist minister. Uh, politics uh, was in Bob's family. <coughs> in 1924, his uncle Albert had become South Australia's youngest ever member of parliament when he won the seat of Burra Burra in the mid-north of South Australia, uh, which included, uh, <coughs> interestingly enough, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the town of Farrell Flat, uh, not far from my uh, vineyard. Uh, and uh, he was elected to, uh, for Labor in the House of Assembly at the uh, tender age of 23. After losing the seat by just 11 votes in 1927, he moved to Western Australia, where he would uh, later become Premier, serving that role in that role from 1953 to 1959. When Bob's uh, older uh, brother Neil died of meningitis in his late teens, the family also moved to Western Australia. Of course, uh, Bob Hawke's uh, early years in Bordertown mean that uh, we proudly claim him uh, as a South Australian, <coughs> the only Australian Prime Minister who was actually born in South Australia. Julia Gillard, that other great South Australian Prime Minister, was of course born in Wales, uh, but uh, grew up in, in, uh, in Adelaide. From humble beginnings, uh, Bob Hawke grew to become a giant of the Labor movement uh, and of the Labor Party. First, though, he had to complete his studies as a Rhodes Scholar uh, at uh, Oxford uh, University. It was there that he famously established a world record for sculling a yard of ale. In 2015, I took my grandson, Edward Malika, who was born in Oxford, to see the memorial uh, to Bob at the Turf Tavern, where that uh, particular event occurred. Bob joined the Australian Council of Trade Unions in 1956 as a research officer, replacing uh, Harold Souter, uh, the ACTU's first ever research officer, who then became acting secretary. For the next 13 years, he ran the national wage cases, lifting the wages and living standards of all Australians. In 1969, he narrowly defeated Souter, who was the right-wing candidate, to become elected ACTU president. I first met Bob Hawke in 1979 at the uh, ACTU Congress in Melbourne at uh, the now knocked down Dallas Brooks Hall uh, in, East, uh, in East Melbourne. By this time his support base in the Labor movement had shifted from the left to the right. And the big debate at the conference was on the banning of uranium mining at Jabaluka in the Northern Territory, which you might recall, <coughs> Mr Acting Deputy President. Bob spoke cogently and passionately on the issue for hours, uh, only to lose the debate. He left uh, the ACTU and then entered Parliament in uh, uh, 1980. And then in 1983, as the recently elected uh, Labor leader, he won a smashing victory and never lost a federal election as Prime Minister. 1984, <coughs> in order to provide extra support to Bob as the new Labor leader, um, my union, the SDA, which had not been affiliated to the ALP in Victoria since the split in the 1950s, rejoined the party. My predecessor as uh, national president of the SDA, Jim Ma, was pelted with tomatoes at the Victorian conference that uh, they were readmitted to uh, the ALP, thus creating the, uh, 
the name tomato left in that, uh, in that state. In uh, 1988, I was pre-selected as Labor's candidate for the federal seat of Adelaide. In the by-election following Chris Herford's resignation and appointment to the Consul General in New York, <coughs> in what became known as the timed telephone call by-election, Bob got the message that the public didn't like the idea and uh, I lost the first of uh, many political battles. I still remember the day very vividly. <coughs> I was travelling with Bob and then Premier of South Australia John Bannon to launch the new Mitsubishi Magna at uh, Tonsley Park. Bob got a call <coughs> and after he hung up and said, we've got an election issue. I said, what is it? And Bob said, the Libs are silly enough to support Telstra's call for timed telephone calls. Later that day, after a successful campaign launch at the North Adelaide Football Club, Bob did a press conference. The final question, <coughs> and out of the blue, he was asked, uh, will you support timed telephone calls? And Bob said, yes. In the car later, <coughs> taking Bob to the airport, I said, I thought we were going to oppose timed telephone calls. And he said, well, it's too late now, I've said it. And of course, it was too late. Bob Hawke was Prime Minister from the 11th of March uh, 1983 to the 20th of December 1990, uh, 1991. And he was a great Prime Minister. Among his achievements, many already recognised today, as I'm sure many more will be, it's worth highlighting that it was uh, Bob Hawke who floated the Australian dollar opened the Australian economy to the world, creating, to this day, 28 years of continuous economic growth. Founded the Australian Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation Forum, APEC, created Medicare, gave the Commonwealth power over World Heritage Sites, stopped the damming of the uh, Tasmanian uh, Franklin River, prioritised and started World Heritage listing of Kakadu, adopted green and gold uh, as our national colours. After he left the Prime Ministership, I caught up with Bob again in Vienna in 1995. It was only a week or so before he was due to marry his second wife, Blanche d'Arpouget. Bob was back uh, amongst his old union mates and was happy to share yarns, cigars and a few glasses of beer. But I'm not sure that Blanche approved. In, 19, uh, <coughs> sorry, in 2007, Bob Hawke was in Adelaide supporting uh, the now uh, member for Spence, Nick Champion, who was at the time Labor's candidate in what uh, was then the federal seat of Wakefield. My daughter, Teresa, volunteered, volunteered to help out and was given the job of being Bob's uh, driver. He declared her the best driver that he'd ever had. On the way back into town, he did get a little bit upset when he thought Blanche had forgotten to ring the Hyatt Hotel where he was staying that night to put in an order for Palmer's and cheese on his spaghetti that night. Blanche hadn't forgotten, of course. It was just that uh, Bob, uh, Bob just couldn't hear her uh, calling. My oldest daughter, who's got a rather famous photograph with Bob from the time she was three years old, also used to serve Bob at the uh, George's Fish Cafe on Goodger Street when he came to Adelaide for meetings of the, uh, the Hawke Foundation. Like many in this place and the other place, I was honoured to attend the memorial at the Sydney Opera House with my wife and daughter last month. That memorial, appropriately I believe, focused on Bob's, uh, Bob Hawke's achievements and hard work rather than his charisma or his larrikinism. Australia owes much to Bob Hawke to this day, from the establishment of Medicare to the protection of our unique and precious environment and the adoption of our national sporting colours. Uh, he was a Prime Minister who worked for Australians and for Australia's future. He will be greatly missed. Senator Ayres. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, this is not my first speech and I thank the Senate for allowing me this contribution to this important condolence debate in advance of my first speech. I don't mind saying uh, that I wept when I heard that Bob Hawke had died. I think that my kids were a little mystified when they saw this sudden and unexplained outburst of emotion from their dad. I wept because Bob Hawke's tenure as Prime Minister was the soundtrack to my teenage years. It was impossible for my adolescent experience to conceive of the Australia that went before Hawke, 
of the enormous feat of imagination, courage and leadership that it took to drag the country from the torpor of conflict and stagnation after the nation-building phase of the post-war years into a new Australia. Hawke conjured a modern Australia where working and middle-class people's lives were changed by the power of government. His four election victories between 1983 and 1991 cemented Labor social democratic achievements. Transformative change, the kind that is felt in the lived experiences of all Australians, take not just winning government but long-term government to make reform durable. Hawke taught Labor and the Labor movement about the value of national consensus and governing in the interests of all Australians as the core propositions of Labor governments. That lesson is vital. There has been an enormous effort to rewrite history by conservative commentators and Hawke's erstwhile political opponents. The endless column inches about the Hawke-Keating era of reform are rarely written by people who are genuinely motivated by the same principles that underpinned Hawke's achievements. It is as if the Conservatives at the time supported all or any of Hawke's efforts to reform our economy, our society, our democracy or his conception of modern Australia's place in the world. These were all hard things to do. Uh, and his opponents were much more venal and op opportunistic then than they now claim. The consensus that Bob sought was built out of a radical proposition that transformative change required genuine consultation with every Australian and with the organisations that they formed. It was a deep egalitarianism, a commitment to inclusion that must surely have been forged in his years in the trade union movement. In practice, this meant governing in cooperation with the institutions that were capable of representing and consulting with ordinary Australians. Kim Beasley set it out best in his eulogy at Hawke's Grand Memorial at the Sydney Opera House just a few weeks ago. He said he governed with the peak organisations, the unions of course, but also the employer groups, indigenous, environmental and rural groups multicultural, arts, sporting, social and religious groups. For him, they were the transmission belts of change to the community, feedback and adjustment. It was the legitimacy of the institutions that represented people and his ability to work constructively with them that was core to the changes that the Hawke government made. He summarised this approach in his 1988 Boyer lecture where he said, Within Australia, we have together, I think, found the secret of a successful society. It is simple and it is powerful. It is to formulate policies with maximum input from those likely to be affected, to take account of the aspirations of all of the significant groups and to seek to harmonise as far as possible the actions of those groups. Hawke understood the value of democratic participation that democracy doesn't begin and end at the ballot box, electing representative governments that implement policy to individual consumers of government services. Our democracy is or should be built on the fundamental belief that citizens are capable of understanding and interacting with power and that the expression of that belief is collective organisation. Active participation in unions and associations, migrant organisations, environment groups, churches, RSLs, is a core feature of a healthy democracy, and it's government's job to encourage and facilitate that vital democratic work. Democracy doesn't stop at the factory gate, and it should flourish in our workplaces and communities. Hawke's vision of a healthy, pluralist social democracy as much about the way that change is delivered as the outcome of the change itself puts his opponent's tepid neoliberal version of consumer democracy in the shade. And it was core to the achievements of that period of successful reforming government. I don't think it's possible to talk about Bob Hawke without his commitment to internationalism and racial equality. His mobilisation of Chogham sanctions against the racist apartheid regime in South Africa, against significant opposition including here in Australia, was crucial to deposing that fascist, racist regime. 
and his commitment to democracy is surely reflected in his brave and principled decision to allow more than 40,000 Chinese students to stay in Australia in the wake of the Tiananmen Square massacre. I met Bob Hawke many times in my career <coughs> as a trade union official, and all of them were memorable, and I'll treasure those memories. I'll never forget finishing a dinner with him at the Gold Coast. We were interrupted by people all the way to the restaurant and by passers-by all the way through the dinner. Bob would have been in his early 80s and he was generous and genuine and spontaneous with all of them. To be around him was to experience a mix of charm, principle and raw intelligence. We returned very late to our hotel that night to find that the bar had sensibly closed. I uh, convinced the manager to reopen it, uh, essentially using Bob's name to open the bar, <laughs> and we kept the bar humming for more hours than was sensible. A crowd of patrons sat to hear Bob sing, tell terrific stories and to make jokes that will not bear repeating in this place. I was also there as a young university industrial relations student at the University of Sydney in 1993 when Hawke gave the inaugural Kingsley Laffer Lecture, hosted by Professor Russell Lansbury, and that in large part inspired my commitment to industrial relations as a field of study and work, a commitment to workplace democracy and the great potential of the Australian labour movement to affect lasting beneficial change for all Australians. Vale Robert James Lee Hawke, Australian unionist, politician, Prime Minister, larrikin and leader. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, our nation has lost a true <coughs> champion in Bob Hawke. Bob Hawke visibly loved Australia. It is a love we celebrate today, and it is a love returned to him. It's a privilege to be a member of this place today to pay my respects as this new parliament begins, to remember the values for which he stood and that he drew on throughout his life, be that in the trade union movement or uh, within uh, leading the Australian government. Like our former Prime Minister, it was a great privilege to be a graduate of the University of Western Australia, and um, uh, it's a privilege I share with him. He's still very much uh, fondly re revered and remembered there. He said uh, when reflecting on his time at UWA uh, during the university's centenary dinner back in 2011, he gave praise for UWA in fact being Australia's first free university. He said, I had the opportunity of coming to this great institution, the only free institution, the free university in the British Empire. As a result of the marvellous bequest of Sir John Winthrop Hackett, some £450,000 back in 1911. That's, kind of, that's about $33 million. And Bob Hawke said that enabled students from poorer backgrounds like myself to come here. He went on to say, I believe all of you here tonight will share my indebtedness, my deep sense of indebtedness to the University of Western Australia for its continuous unqualified and rigorous commitment over 100 years of its existence to pure, unadulterated teaching and research. And that fondness uh, for Bob Hawke uh, is felt throughout Western Australia and indeed through the community uh, of UWA. And it's a good place for me to start these remarks because it's an indebtedness that I share along uh, with the Hawke and Keating government's strong commitment to accessible higher education in our nation. An indebtedness for so many things, be that um, equal opportunity, environmental protection, a strong economy and, importantly, Australia's sense of place in the world. I've enjoyed uh, today and over recent weeks hearing so much about his critical legacies and those of the Hawke Keating government. And I want to share with the chamber today one of those legacies that ranks right at the top for me. And it was Bob Hawke's infamous pledge that no Australian child would live in poverty. It is a pledge today that was ridiculed over time, 
but should be viewed as one of the Hawke government's most critical achievements, uh, not as an embarrassment for which it was offered views. He was supposed to say no child should live in poverty by 1990, not that no child would live in poverty. But the fact of the matter is that the measures announced by the Hawke government back in 1987 would have had the effect of immediately cutting the number of children in poverty by about 33 and 36 per cent in our nation. The legacy that I remember in this place today were those falls in child poverty around our nation, a fall of some 50 per cent in non-working single parents and 80 per cent among non-working couples with children. You know, there were simple practical measures like the family allowance supplement linked to wage growth, uniform rent assistance for social security recipients with children, a new child disability allowance and the child support agency, which for the first time used the tax system to collect child support payments from non-custodial parents. In the time after Bob Hawke's infamous speech, government spending in per, chi per child in low-income families in our nation jumped by some 61 per cent. 61 per cent in real terms for children aged 0 to 12 and 124 per cent for children 13 to 15. And I'm sad to say in our nation that in recent years these outcomes have slipped. We are, we, in our nation we have more than 700,000 children living in poverty. The number of children in poverty in our nation has not de uh, de continued to decrease, but it has climbed some 2 per cent in the last 10 years. So to be true to Hawke's legacy, as we look to debate the tax bills uh, in this parliament, we can and should, as he would have done, reflect on where our nation's precious resources are directed. So for myself and so many other Australians, Bob was a figure embodying our sense of Australia. As a West Australian, I very much remember as a child his character on display during the historic win of the America's Cup. The glee and debate and laughter in our household when Bob Hawke said, any boss who sacks anyone for not turning up today is a bum. It was uh, a taste of the time in our state, a time of great excitement and development. The first time I ever saw Bob Hawke in the flesh, and I was very privileged to meet him a number of times in my political career, but the first time was as a child, surrounded by dancing girls in the lead up to the America's Cup down in Fremantle. It was my first experience of seeing figures in public life up close. That was apart from the time my mother took me to see the Queen arrive at Perth Airport in the 1970s. But Bob's actions and attitudes instilled in us uh, a sense of pride in our Australian character, but not a sense of arrogance. One of the things I most admire about him uh, are reflections not uh, in my later political life, but back in my childhood where I could see how his leadership was important not just in Australia but globally. It was part of defining what it meant to me as a child in, in my connectedness to the world. It was about being a global citizen. And it's a sense of identity we still leverage from today. We also have a great deal to thank to him for our national identity in multiculturalism, internationalism, as I said before, environmentalism, equality, a fair go for all. He was able to define for us who we were and what we stood for as a country. They were there in the government's actions. It was there in our words. And it reminds me that this comes down not just to our character as a nation, but to our character as people, not as collective people, 
only, but also as individuals, in terms of the things that we value as people in our nation. When we say we value our sense of multiculturalism, internationalism, we value our local in our environment, we value a fair go. When they are things that we embody as individuals that we celebrate inside ourselves as part of our own character, it was wonderful to see those things on display in our Prime Minister, in Bob Hawke, so visibly as part of his character. For someone of my generation, the way he has shaped my own character is abundantly clear to me. His policies, his leadership, but importantly, as I've said, the values that his government promulgated. They've shaped me as a person. I know I share that sense with a great many other Australians. In Bob Hawke, his actions always spoke louder than words, and Bob's actions were a mighty roar. He has been such a great part of our national character, a humble inspiration for my own, and he will be greatly missed. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Much has been spoken today in this place on the legacy of Bob Hawke, and it is a great honour for me to add my remarks on the life of the Honourable Robert James Lee Hawke, AC, Prime Minister of Australia from 1983 to 1981. I don't, um, as, a, as a drinker, I won't be regaling this. As a non-drinker, I won't be regaling the Senate with stories of me in a bar with Bob Hawke. And uh, despite a hearing from other senators today, how they penned a letter to Bob Hawke, uh, I didn't do that either. But I did meet him on many occasions, and I'm very proud that um, he, he led our country. But who could forget Bob Hawke, those of us who are old enough, when as president of the ACTU he would demolish journalists on TV? Seemingly to me, it seemed almost every night uh, he would be on the television uh, in his fiery defence of workers and trade unions. This is the Bob Hawke I first became aware of. I joined the Labor Party in 1983, just shortly before Bob Hawke challenged Bill Hayden and won the leadership of the party. So for me, Bob Hawke as our leader and our PM is personal. His changes impacted my life and the lives of my family in a positive way. There are four areas that I want to mention today in my remarks, and I'd like to begin with Medicare. The chequered history of Medibank and Medicare, introduced first by Whitlam, fundamentally changed by Fraser and finally settled by Hawke, made a fundamental difference to the availability of quality health care for me and my family. Private health insurance under Fraser was a significant burden on my family. We were a low-income family. Whitlam's introduction of Medicare initially provided relief to us and, of course, delivered affordable health care sadly short-lived as Fraser tore down those reforms. I recall during this time of not visiting doctors because of the cost and of always using the accident and emergency departments of our already overburdened public hospitals, as I at that time, as a low-income earner, had no other choice. <coughs> so, of course, the election of the Hawke government and the return to the original model set up under Whitlam was cause for much celebration for me as a young woman, as a young parent of young children. And for me, I lived the words described by Neil Blewett when he introduced the legislation with the words that Medicare would be simple, fair and affordable. The next area I want to touch on is the Franklin Dam, and a few people here have spoken about that today. Whitlam's access reforms to university enabled to me to enrol in university as a mature age student, although not so old at 26. Apart from studying, I got involved in a range of campaigns. One of these was opposing the damming of the Franklin River. This opposition movement to the dam, 
which would have flooded the Franklin River, river was Australia-wide, and for many it was their first real campaign. It seemed to me at the time we were very active in Western Australia, although a long way from Tasmania, and particularly active at Murdoch University. What Bob did was <coughs> nothing short of miraculous. He fought the Liberals at every turn, both here in the federal parliament and in the state of Tasmania, as they thwarted his attempts to stop the dam. He came back with yet another strategy to stop their ambition to dam and destroy this magnificent river. In the end, he was successful. The Tasmanian dam case is the most famous and influential environmental law case in Australian history. It was also a landmark in Australian constitutional law. In 1981, the area in which the dam was proposed was nominated for listing under the World Heritage Convention, but that wasn't enough to save the damming. It wouldn't have pre pre prevented the construction of the dam. To stop it, what was required was the incorporation of the protection of the area under international law and incorporating that into Australian domestic law. The Commonwealth took the matter to the High Court and sought and won an injunction. The decision continues to have importance in Australia today. Today, large parts of Australia's main environmental law come from this Franklin River decision. And years later, when I visited the dam and saw its pristine state, I couldn't believe that at one time we were going to destroy that magnificent river. And I thank Bob for his um, absolute undying attention to stopping that proposal. The other area I want to touch on is uranium mining. And uranium mining is a vexed issue in the Labor Party, but I stand in opposition to uranium mining. And this was demonstrated, that vexed issue in the Labor Party, between Whitlam and Hawke. Land belonging to the Mirra people of the Kakadu West Arnhem region in the Northern Territory was first targeted as a location for uranium mining in 1974. Again, I was an active opponent of that proposal. When the Whitlam government signed agreements with two mining companies to provide uranium ore to Japan, upon election in 1983, Bob Hawke buried the Jabaluka project by declaring the export permits for Jabaluka uranium would not be granted. He also gave highly publicised priority to the World Heritage Listing of Kakadu National Park. The park was inscribed on the World Heritage List in, these, in three stages, but of course um, the mining of uranium at Jabaluka today, whilst in limbo, uh, some would think is unfinished business. The last area that I really want to touch on today that profoundly uh, affected me uh, and enabled me to have um, to achieve much more than I would have if it hadn't been for Hawke is the area of gender discrimination in the workplace. In 1984, the Sex Discrimination Act, as it was called then, outlawed sex discrimination in the workplace. Bob Hawke, of course, appointed Susan Ryan to the portfolio of Minister Assisting the Prime Minister for the Status of Women, and she served in that role from 1983 to 1988. As Susan Ryan said, and I quote, when Bob was swept into power in 1983 with his team of ministers, he had a comprehensive policy agenda ready to go. It included the achievements for which he is most commonly praised, restructuring and strengthening Australia's economy, globalising it and abandoning outdated measures like protection, reforming taxation and building strong relationships with our regional neighbours. It also included the most detailed set of commitments to Australian women ever developed. We delivered on virtually all of them. A lot was highly controversial and not widely populate, popular. At the time, 
And this is uh, unbelievable because 1983 for some of us doesn't seem so long ago. It was not unlawful to sack women who married. It was not unlawful to sack women who became pregnant or just because they were women. Maternity leave was scarcely available. Women could not get home loans. Girls' education was restricted and fewer girls got into higher education. Most of our community thought this was all okay. Bob Hawke and Susan Ryan also presided over the passing of the Affirmative Action Equal Opportunity for Women Act of 1986 and a massive increase in spending on childcare. There was considerable political opposition to all these reforms, including when it came to childcare and affirmative action laws, even from within Hawke's own cabinet. Without his strong endorsement, they would not have happened. The Sex Discrimination Act, as it was known at that time, changed Australia in a fundamental way. For the first time, there was federal protection against discrimination on the grounds of sex, which of course these days we refer to as gender, <coughs> marital status and the condition of pregnancy and employment, and the provision of a range of goods and services. In practice, what Bob Hawke and Susan Ryan achieved was that it was then, from 1983 onwards, against the law to treat women differently to deny them employment because they were pregnant, for, exist, for instance, or because they were married. Hawke's legacy lies not just in his successful reintroduction of Medicare and the other outstanding achievements he achieved. Um, throughout the rest of his time as Prime Minister, his ability to make radical policy change for the benefit of the general public against the direct wishes of the powerful groups in our society provides useful lessons for political leaders of today. The memorial held at the Opera House last month was wonderful, packed to the rafters and live streamed to the crowd watching outside. I pay my sincere condolences to Blanche, to Bob's children, his stepson, his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren. It was only fitting that we sang Solidarity, together, Solidarity Forever, as we had on many occasions before with Bob, and for the beautiful rendition on the didgeridoo of Land Down Under. Vale, Bob Hawke, and rest in peace. Senator Gallagher. <coughs> I rise to also make a brief contribution to this condolence motion and to honour the life of former Prime Minister Bob Hawke. As I reflected at the time of his passing, Bob Hawke was Prime Minister when I first became interested in politics. His government inspired me and showed me that what happens in politics matters and helps to shape the nation. I'm, certainly, I'm certain that I'm not the only Labor politician of my generation in this place that was energised by Bob's example or continues to draw inspiration from the example of his passionate leadership and his government's prodigious record of achievement. But Bob Hawke was not only a giant of the Labor movement and the Labor Party, he was also a leader who commanded respect right across the political divide. In politics, that is no mean accomplishment and something that current politicians can learn a lesson or two from. He has an enduring legacy which Australians continue to benefit from today. Every time we go to the GP or a hospital, we are benefiting from the work that Bob Hawke started by establishing Medicare, building on the work of another great Labor politician, Gough Whitlam. Australia's universal health system is the envy of many countries around the world. Medicare and the system that Bob was key in building not only ensures all people have access to health care when they need it, but also makes a strong statement about the kind of country we are, a compassionate and accommodating nation that makes sure that your bank balance or your financial situation is not an impediment to gaining health care, often at some of the darkest moments in one's life. It certainly ranks amongst the greatest of, of Labor's achievements. In fact, it's difficult to think of a more practical expression of Labor values than Medicare. Bob also achieved many other policy milestones during his time as Prime Minister. His passion for people 
at the heart of government policy and decision making was clear. He protected the environment by preventing mining in culturally significant sites and saved the Franklin River in Tasmania. He opened up the Australian economy to the world and floated the dollar. And as many others have spoken of his incredible national and international achievements. But as a proud Canberran and the ACT Senator, I also wanted to focus my remarks on Bob Hawke and Canberra. Bob loved Canberra, our nation's capital. It's the city that I'm proud to call home and represent here in the Australian Senate. Bob not only lived here when he was Prime Minister, but also took up residence in the nation's capital between 1956 and 58, while he studied his Doctorate of Law at the Australian National University, focusing on the Australian wage-fixing system. Bob's larrikin behaviour was on show back at that time when he decided to take advantage of the absence of the master at University House residence on the ANU campus. Historian Dr Jill Waterhouse recounted the story in the Canberra Times recently, telling how he and a group of fellow students stormed around the residence where unmarried PhD students lived and also went for a swim in the ornamental pond, home to some goldfish. The midnight swim disturbed a visiting conference of bishops who were said to be very un unimpressed. The official incident report stated that a drunken party involving shouting and stampeding about the courtyard, swimming in the pool, the use of obscene language, banging on doors, was not calculated <coughs> to help with the public relations of the university. The event secured Bob's banishment from University House, and he was also asked to leave the College Council as well as incurring a £15 fine. It was perhaps a mark of what was to come. He did challenge the authorities, who were unimpressed, but he gained the admiration and applause of his fellow students. Bob did, however, base himself here in Canberra for the duration of his time as Prime Minister and made the lodge on Adelaide Avenue home, moving in in 1983. Bob was Prime Minister for the opening of the building we stand in today, Australia's new, at the time, Parliament House. Few buildings are more closely associated with Canberra, and there are a few visitors to this city who do not visit this incredible building. But nothing sums up Bob's passion for Canberra more than his love of something much more humble than the grandeur of Parliament House, the Canberra Raiders. It's reported that when he was asked why he went for the Raiders, despite being a member of Parliament with an electorate in Melbourne, he responded with, because I live in the bloody place. Bob was a loyal and passionate fan of the Raiders and was their number one ticket holder from 1983 onwards. He also reportedly hosted premiership celebrations and commiserations at the lodge, but, and he was also spotted from time to time walking into the Raiders' change rooms following games. It's these stories that occurred right here in the nation's capital that confirm that Bob Hawke was indeed a Prime Minister for the people and one that saw the value in Canberra as the heart of the nation. He was one of the few Prime Ministers of recent times who have made Canberra his home and immersed themselves into Canberra life. I was also struck by the words of former Hawke Press Secretary Jeff Walsh, who said that Hawke was a true Canberra supporter, and not only because he lived here during his Prime Ministership. He said he was a defender of the national capital, both intrinsically in the sense of it being the seat of government for the whole country, but also in terms of its functionality and utility. In this is a quote, people would sometimes be critical of Canberra, and he, in his ultra logical way, would say, Well, if you look at the quality of policy making that comes out of Canberra, you couldn't complain about how well the nation is being served in terms of economic prosperity, national security, the conduct of international relations, all of which were essentially run to a large degree out of the Canberra bureaucracy. Canberra is home to the Australian Public Service. It's made up of thousands of Canberrans and many more around the nation who work hard every day to support the government and to ensure that the government's agenda is delivered. Too often, I think politicians and media commentators alike using Canberra, use Canberra and the APS as a punching bag or as an easy scapegoat for policy failings. Hawke had a passion for the Canberra bureaucracy and the essential role that the APS plays in our democratic system reminds us that we should always value our public servants and federal bureaucracy more. Bob taught us that we, as Labor, uh, as Labor and in Labor in government, have a duty to be bold with our agenda and change Australia for the better. In Bob's passing, we as the Labor Party should be reminded <coughs> of the significant value that Labor governments make to the social fabric of our nation. He always showed us in very practical ways that we should embrace change and be visionary with our agenda 
and not be deterred by narrow-minded rhetoric of some other parties or politicians that occupy the hallways. He demonstrated that policy should always be developed with people at its core. Bob will be missed, but he will always be remembered. His legacy is immense. His personality was unforgettable. His passion for Australia and for Australians was infectious. His contribution to Australia and to uh, the, the broader world will never be forgiven, forgotten. Sorry. On behalf of the people of the ACT, I pass my condolences on to his wife, his children and grandchildren. You have the support of a nation standing with you at this time. Thank you. Senator Dodson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. I first met Bob Hawke in 1980 at the height of the Nukumbar dispute when First Nations peoples united to take on the Western Australian Liberal a government of Sir Charles Court and the international mining company AMAX, which wanted to drill on sacred land. And the meeting took place at Tullamarine, and Bob struggled with the concept of a sacred site of land at a place called Pea Hill. However, he listened intently and promised to do what he could at that time. Bob was then president of the Australian Council of Trade Unions and a key ally in what would become one of Australia's most significant demonstrations of non-violent resistance. Nukenbar was a turning point for First Nations land rights, and Bob Hawke, along with his son Stephen, then a liaison officer with the community, promoted the cause to national significance. Much has been said in the weeks since the death of Bob Hawke about his love for his country and its peoples. I have some, uh, some reservations about some of that, and I approach his legacy, and I know some of my colleagues approach it with some frustration and anger and annoyance that First Nations, uh, because he couldn't achieve and deliver some of the, because of some of the vested interest and the hard right attitudes in our community when it came to treaty and national land rights in particular. I reflect on the period with ambivalence and great disappointment and regret that what could have been and what he hoped would be because of his sense of pragmatism and his sense of understanding of the challenges Bob faced, we were not able to receive or achieve the unity of the Australian people with his aim and vision and ours. The reality is that Bob's empathy for the cause of First Nations was not shared by the broader Australian population at the time. Political leadership should reflect hard on this conundrum as pivotal to the process of reconciliation. He was at ease in the company of blackfellas because his belief system did not allow for discrimination. And although he did shy away from the regime of national land rights, and although he did rush, uh, he had a rush of fervour towards a treaty, the promise of a treaty with Aboriginal people and failed to deliver it, he did remain committed to high ideals of reconciliation. And when he did deliver, like the time he put Aboriginal cultural values above those of developed minded colleagues and prevailed over cabinet to veto mining at Coronation Hill in the Northern Territory. He stand on First Nations views, in our view, contributed to his demise as a Prime Minister. In the case of his, walk, his, walking, his walking away from the national land rights agenda, let's face and acknowledge the awful reality that powerful forces were arraigned against him. The hysterical lobby of a virulent mining industry, sadly backed by an equally virulent Premier of my home state, Western Australia, killed that aspiration. But today I put aside the Prime Ministerial failures of Bob Hawke because he was, in his heart, a committed friend of Australia's Indigenous peoples. I was the director of the Central Land Council when Bob Hawke attended the annual Barunga Sports Cultural Festival in June 1988, the year of Australia's bicentenary. Jerry Hand, the minister of the time, was a great help 
and getting Bob to Barunga. There are many stories to be told about that and Jerry would remember them, especially for the need of Bob to have a pair of red underwear on in case he was needed to go to the ceremonies. It was there that he was presented with the Barunga Statement by the chairmen of the Northern and Central Land Councils. The Barunga Statement was an historic declaration of self-determination and of cultural Aboriginal culture. It requested the Commonwealth Parliament to negotiate a treaty recognising Aboriginal prior ownership, continued occupation and sovereignty and affirming our human rights and freedoms over 30 years ago. In return, the Prime Minister, Mr Hawke, famously declared, there shall be a treaty. Although he was unable to deliver on that commitment by the time he left office in December 1991, he did, did deliver on his commitment to Indigenous self-determination. His demonstration of that was the creation of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission in 1990. That gave a real voice to Indigenous people, regionally and nationally. It was a real instrument of self-determination and self-management. However, it suffered as a creature of legislation. Alas, ATSIC was dismantled by the Howard government in 2005. And a year after ATSIC was established, <laughs> Prime Minister Hawke established the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation. I well remember when he, his then Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Robert Tickner, was dispatched to Derby to try and woo me to take up the job as the Council's first chairman. At that stage in my life, I was reluctant to return to the national stage after my experience of working as a Royal Commissioner into Aboriginal deaths in custody. And let me remind you that the Royal Commission was Bob Hawke's calling. He was appalled by the proliferation of suicides amongst Aboriginal people in custody, and he withstood criticism from those, including those from within his own party, who saw the Royal Commission as a waste of time and money. Anyway, back to the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation and the government's effort to recruit me to chair it. My grandfather had just passed away and I was wanting to anchor myself in my own country and culture. That was until Bob Hawke himself got on the phone. His powers to conjole and curse are acknowledged by all who have ever dealt with him. But it was not until you were subjected to that special Hawke treatment that you really appreciated that you had been confronted by a great persuader. I yielded in the face of his supplication and agreed to sign on as the Foundation Chairman for the Council of Aboriginal Reconciliation. Little did I know that he had only a few months left in office as the Prime Minister. Fitting then that it was his last duty, literally in the last few minutes of his Prime Ministership in December 91, was to unveil the Barunga Statement in the Parliament House, where it rests today. In that brief ceremony, Mr Hawke said <coughs> he promised in 88, back at Barunga, to hang the Barunga Statement in the Parliament House. And I quote, for whoever is Prime Minister of this country, not only to see, but to understand and also to honour, unquote. The presence of the Barunga Statement in this great building, he called on those to follow him to continue to find solutions to the abundant problems that still face Aboriginal peoples in this country. Nearly three decades have passed away since that exhortation, but those last words of Prime Minister Bob Hawke still hang in the air. May they remind us and inspire us, inspire us all that we are yet to reconcile as a nation. Bob was passionate about our nation, and when Bob Hawke was talking about reconciliation, he wasn't talking about just practical reconciliation, the myth that simply adjusting social and economic policy settings constitute real reconciliation. He knew it had to be about finding an accommodation of the rights and interests of the sovereign position First Nations held and never ceded. In fact, he identified this false dichotomy in his first item of substantive business when he moved to this new parliament house on the 23rd of August 1988. 
Back then he said, and again I quote, the true remedy does not lie purely in the allocation of resources, for if we provide budgetary assistance but not hope, not confidence, not effective consultation and not reconciliation, then that assistance will fail to lift Aboriginal and Islander peoples from their disadvantaged state." Unquote. More than 30 years on from that speech, reconciliation may have become an insipid word or even a corrupted concept because of the dashed hope, broken promises, the corporatisation and the program failures to close the gap amid glittering functions at the well-off end of town. The Uluru Statement from the Heart is a plea to the Australian people. It captures the contemporary and historical dispossession experienced by First Nations peoples. And I quote, the tyranny of our powerlessness is about being constantly ground down and denied in preference to every other interest, constant delays and broken hopes. The time for such measures, such piecemeal measures have gone. The proposal of a pathetic voice to the parliament reliant upon a power supported by a referendum has not shifted the political appetite to commit with, wider, with clear time frames. Such an interim measure, if achieved by way of referendum, could spark hope and indicate Australia is serious in entirely establishing a new relationship with First Nations peoples. The embarkment upon a treaty pathway, enlightened by truth-telling, would work towards healing our past and laying the foundations of unity for our future. In relation to the abundant problems referred to by Bob Hawke, and they still exist today, they still beset us. And there is still a way, but there is still a way out of this conundrum. And my appeal to the political leadership of today in, in remembrance of the commitment of Bob Hawke is that we address the hard task of reconciliation. We address the question of treaty and we set out the treaty framework process for treating with First Nations as part of their mantra of voice, truth and treaty making. That we own up to the constant detrimental procrastination and that we work to give pride to all Australians of goodwill, give certainty for First Nations and return politics to something decent in the manner of Bob Hawke's leadership despite his attempts and failures, but that we, in our unity, we can make real. Until we reach such an ultimate resolution, we will always remain a damaged and divided nation. Thank you. Senator Ricard. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Today I join colleagues in paying my respects to a great Australian, Bob Hawke. Bob was Australia's 23rd Prime Minister, former head of the Australian U Union Movement as the president of the ACTU, winning four elections for Labor. He gave us Medicare, superannuation for all and access to higher education and training. He shaped our modern Australian identity opening the Australian economy to the world, improving our ties with Asia and providing the international <coughs> excuse me, leadership needed to end apartheid and protect Antarctica. Without peer, Bob changed our country and our world for the better. A key early memory of mine is not in industrial relations but in international affairs. Bob's outspoken advocacy against the Vietnam War was fundamentally a matter of workers' rights. Our sons and brothers were being conscripted to fight America's war in Vietnam. Too many lost their lives and those who returned faced misguided aggression and years of isolation. Always sensing an opportunity to heal, it was in 1987 <clears throat> that Bob declared the 18th of August as Vietnam Veterans Day. And since then, Australia has better embraced our Vietnam vets, including those conscripted for service. Bob's fir firm stance on apartheid in South Africa was an inspiration to the world over. Workers standing in solidarity with Nelson Mandela, himself a committed trade unionist, and all South Africans in their pursuit of self-determination and freedom. Some said at the time that sport and politics 
shouldn't mix. But sport is humanity's way of Im imitating battle and celebrating life, and the courage of banning the South, Australian, uh, sorry, South African cricket and rugby teams was pivotal in changing hearts and minds. As Prime Minister, Bob's leadership on the Antarctic is particularly special for us Tasmanians. As Australia's gateway to Antarctica, Bob's ability to deliver the Antarctic Treaty and conserve our great southern continent for science has given my state the ability to trade off our geographic advantages, inspiring thousands of young Tasmanians to study the Antarctic, her plants, animals and culture and climate, and in the pursuit of greater knowledge about us as a species and our precious world. In this long-term economic economic vision that comes back time and again when recalling Bob's, Bob's achievements. When he came to power in 1983, Labor failed to win a seat from Tasmania in the House of Representatives. Tasmanians don't like to be told how to manage our state from inner-city Melbourne, but we do respect politicians of vision. Over the coming 15 years, Labor would win every seat in Tasmania in part due to Bob and his team's policies that clearly improved the lives of working people. The Franklin River, one of the nation's wildest, is protected forever because of Bob, with many visitors every year enjoying the thrilling ride through her gorges. He's best known as the father of Medicare, Australia's precious public health system, envied the world over for ensuring that a single mum in Devonport, a farmer in Smithton, a factory worker in Burnie and a miner in Queenstown can all access first-rate health care. Two further fundamental pillars of modern Australian society shaped by Bob's leadership are superannuation and gender equality. I started my working life in a factory at Alveston. The division of labour between men and women was clear and it was fierce. Women were casuals, restricted, to the roles in the factory that attracted the lowest pay. Men could drive the forklifts, operate the machinery and, in return, take home the higher pay. Bob's workplace gender reform equality reforms, achieved in 1984 with Australia's first female Minister for Women, Susan Ryan, enabled my union to take forward and win equal opportunity cases that removed some of those barriers, ensuring that women workers were employed and paid based on their skills, not their gender. On the same note, for the first 12 years of my working life, I received no superannuation. Some of my female colleagues who had been working there for decades had no savings for their retirement. Our same story was repeated over and again across the country. When Bob and Labor introduced compulsory superannuation, these women, myself included, had some financial independence for the first time in their lives. We were no longer just workers, but through our own superannuation, had a stake in the companies that run this country. Bob remained a committed unionist and Labor activist in his retirement from politics. Awarded life membership of my union, the AMWU, Bob would regularly attend conferences to share his stories and inspire the next generations. I was privileged to meet Bob on a number of occasions. His stories would entertain and enthral for hours, yep, literally hours. And of course, we would end with a passionate rendition of Solidarity Forever. Underneath Bob's beautiful melodies, the words ring so true. The final lyrics sum up his impact on us, our nation and our world, as Bob sang on so many occasions. In our hands is placed a power greater than their hoarded gold, greater than the might of armies magnified a th thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old, for the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever, Bob Hawke. Senator Chisholm. Thank you. Uh, I join with my colleagues to pay tribute to a remarkable life that was Bob Hawke. And I think that when you think about the combination of intellect, larrikinism, compassion, the understanding of people from all, works of, all, all walks of life, and the fact that he was able to maintain this combination his whole life in the differing roles that he had, and particularly in later life as well. 
It was an authenticity that was unique and combined all the great elements of Australian life. And I think that his achievements that he had are all the more remarkable given that it did happen so close after the devastation that the Labor Party suffered uh, from the end of the Whitlam government. I think when you put it in that historical context, uh, what Hawke was able to achieve with Keating so close to the devastation of the Whitlam government uh, make it all the more remarkable. Uh, so many of my colleagues have already dealt with his um, remarkable life and achievements, and I, I particularly wanted to single out Pat, who I thought, Senator Dodson, who I thought gave uh, a really honest assessment of uh, and some f example of some frustrations um, that, that Indigenous community had and Australians had about a lack of progress, but also a remarkable record uh, in that area as well. And I think Senator Wong outlined his remarkable achievements in the foreign uh, affairs area as well. Um, which obviously have set up Australia so well, uh, but also an immensely proud Labor tradition at the same time. Uh, I wanted to focus on some other aspects, uh, and particularly the role that Bob Hawke played in Queensland, uh, and that was both an achievement in terms of policy, but also remarkable political success at the same time. And I was going to finish with some personal experiences that I had with him as well, uh, similar to Senator Urquhart. Um, but the election win of Bob Hawke in 1983 uh, combined with uh, my first year of primary school. Uh, so I basically had my whole uh, schooling life through the Hawke and Keating government. And uh, I think that uh, when you think about Queensland during the 70s and 80s, um, it was a particularly dark place politically. So obviously uh, we were wiped out following the demise of the Whitlam government. Uh, and we had the ascendancy of the corrupt Murrabon Joe Bjorki Peterson government through that whole period as well. Um, so when the Queensland Labor Party through the 70s and 80s was a pretty bleak, bleak place to be, uh, not much optimism on the horizon, uh, and it was tough times. Uh, when it goes to how that actually had an impact on Queensland, uh, it was just the continual underfunding when it comes to education. Um, we really were left in the dark and left behind when it comes to education, and also thinking about the environment, um, where degradation was the modus operandi of the Bjorki Peterson government. Um, it was a really bleak time that Queensland was suffering. So for Hawke to come in in 1983 and achieve what he did and build that long-term government uh, for true believers in the state uh, and also for those people who relied on Labor governments, uh, it was a real I suppose, saviour for that state combined eventually with the election of the Goss government in 1989. Uh, so I think that uh, when you look at uh, the environmental achievements of Hawke, uh, and there were some significant ones that he achieved, and the fact that he was able to do this despite the hostility of the state Conservative governments at the time uh, make it all the more remarkable. Uh, so there was the listing of the Daintree Tropics and Gondwana rainforests uh, in Queensland. Uh, protecting the Daintree rainforest from logging, uh, saving the Shelburne Bay region of Cape York from sand mining, expanding the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and working with both the NFF and the ACF to set up land care. Uh, so a remarkable list of environmental achievements in that, that were the centrepiece of those achievements in Queensland. And then uh, the other one which I think is really important and says a lot about the Hawke government and the way they were able to achieve so much in Queensland. Uh, and when you look at the university enrolment, so uh, in 1980, Queensland had 22,000 people enrolled in three universities. And then by the time the end of the Keating and Hawke governments, we had 101,000 people enrolled and six universities. And obviously, uh, those additional universities were based in regional areas. So you think about the expansion of people who were able to go to university and the fact that those people were able to do that in regional communities is a remarkable long-standing achievement that has been um, such the betterment of Queensland as a result. Uh, so I think that they're just some, some really practical examples of uh, the impact that his policies and his government had on Queensland, and particularly I, I think they are so relevant given the hostility of the relationship with the Bjorki Peterson government at the time and the fact that he was able to provide that inspiration for Labor people in that state to see that there was a brighter future despite what they were suffering under for such a long time under the Bjorki Peterson government. I think the other thing that goes with that is just the remarkable electoral results 
that Hawke achieved as Prime Minister. Um, so, uh, as uh, people uh, who witnessed the last federal election, um, for Hawke to basically achieve winning 50 per cent of the seats in Queensland over such a long period of time is a remarkable effort, uh, particularly coming so soon after uh, the defeat of the Whitlam government. But I think probably the most remarkable single event was in 1990. So, uh, after winning a number of elections in a row, in 1990 they won the seat of Kennedy. Um, so I wouldn't want to go back and look at the primary vote in Kennedy at the recent federal election, but um, to think that after winning a few elections uh, in 1990 they were able to win the seat of Kennedy with Rob Hulls, uh, who went on to have a successful career in Victoria politics, um, shows you that I suppose the magnetism of Hawke across Queensland. Uh, it wasn't just the South East. Uh, he was able to achieve unbelievable electoral results uh, in regional Queensland as well. Um, just a couple of uh, personal reflections that I wanted to talk, finish on uh, in regards to Bob Hawke. Uh, and a couple of senators in this chamber will remember the 2012 state election pretty well. Uh, and uh, the Labor Party was pretty friendless in the last week of the campaign, and Senator Watt might actually talk about this. Um, but uh, it was pretty bleak times in the last week of the election campaign. Uh, and I just know that the boost in morale that we got, um, we didn't have visitors flying in from other parts of the country trying to help out. Um, but the visit we got from Bob Hawke in that last week of the campaign, um, sure, it didn't necessarily help our vote. Um, but I certainly know that the troops got a real morale boost from that. And I think it shows you his commitment to the Labor cause and the fact that he would be there for us in good times and in bad. Uh, and I still remember that, that he was still prepared to come, uh, still prepared to do that when the result of that election campaign was obvious, uh, and the morale boost that our troops got from that was remarkable. Uh, and uh, I'll finish on this. Uh, one of the best experiences uh, I've ever had as a Labor Party member uh, was in 2016 uh, at the Labor Day weekend in Barcaldon, and that combined with being the 125th anniversary of the Shearer strike. And the special guest for that uh, Labor Day weekend in Barcaldon was Bob Hawke. Uh, and it was just remarkable to see him, obviously reasonably frail at that stage, um, but just the way he was received by the true believers who were there, but also the Labor Day in Barcaldon is a true community event. Uh, people come from all political persuasions, from all walks of life, and it really is a community celebration. And to see the way that Bob Hawke was received um, throughout the weekend, because the way it works in Barcaldon, you need to get there on the Friday and you stick around uh, till uh, afterwards on the Monday. Um, so you end up spending a few days there and, and really get a sense of the community. Um, but to spend that time with Bob, see the way he was received, um, both by true believers, both by uh, those from the community who came along and who travelled from greater distances, um, was a truly special occasion for me and one that I will always remember having that time to spend with him and just see the warmth that, uh, in which Australians hold him and the regard in which they hold him. And of course, Senator Eckhart, you won't be disappointed to know he belted out a very good rendition of Solidarity Forever uh, at the uh, showgrounds in Barcaldon um, with a, uh, a great bunch of support for that as well. Uh, so, uh, Bob Hawke, uh, remarkable achievements, um, particularly in Queensland. Uh, he will forever be an inspiration for those of us uh, who follow in his footsteps, uh, and we pay tribute to his life and we pass on our condolences to his friends and family. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Watt. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I'm very pleased to follow my fellow Queensland Senator, Senator Chisholm, in making a few remarks in this condolence motion for former Labor Prime Minister Bob Hawke. And I'd like to begin at the outset by expressing my sympathy to his wife Blanche, uh, his family members and, of course, his partner in life, work and politics, Hazel. Uh, I was 10 when Bob Hawke was first elected in 1983, and that big win uh, that ushered in 13 years of Labor government uh, was the first election that I remember. Uh, I remember my father helping out on the local Labor campaign, uh, and I'm not entirely sure if it was that election campaign, but I'm pretty sure it was uh, that I remember helping my father deliver copies of uh, the Yellow Pages, uh, which of course doesn't exist anymore, uh, as part of a Labor fundraising drive. Labor uh, raised funds by getting paid to deliver Yellow Pages, and I remember walking up and down the hills of Mount Gravatt uh, with my father to deliver the Yellow Pages. Um, the thing I most remember from that night when Bob Hawke and Labor won in 1983 
uh, was Malcolm Fraser, the outgoing Prime Minister, crying on TV as he lost. And I remember saying to my father, not really knowing who Malcolm Fraser was, being a 10-year-old, um, I remember saying to my father, Dad, why is that guy crying? And my dad was rubbed his hands with glee. He's lost <laughs> um, and he's gone. And my father and my mother and all of my extended family I know were ecstatic uh, to see uh, that Labor re-elected after being in the wilderness um, for a few years after the uh, short-lived Whitlam government, which my family had also been very excited about. So the first Hawke win in 1983 was the first election that I remember, and the first election that I worked on uh, as a volunteer was the 1990 election, federal election, when Bob won, I think it was his fourth term uh, in office. Uh, and again, the thing I remember most about that as a 17-year-old first-year university student handing out how to vote cards at Greenslope State School uh, was that I'd made some rookie errors in being a first-time helper. I'd signed up to hand out how to vote cards through the hottest part of the day, through the middle of the day, for more hours than I probably should have agreed to because I wanted to play my part. But most importantly, what I hadn't realised is that if you're going to do that, you need to take a hat and you need to put on a lot of sun cream, and I did neither. So I remember a couple of days afterwards having this—I mean, sure, we won the election, that was fantastic—but I remember having this terrible sunburn uh, to the point where my face, the, the skin on my nose was peeling, and I remember ripping it off and having this massive scab on my nose for a couple of weeks. But at least the good thing about that was that it was a reminder to me um, that Labor had won the election, that I'd, I'd played my little part in that. So it was, it was a good election to be part of. Um, the Hawke government, as, as, as many others have said, the Hawke government had an incredible influence, obviously, obviously on Australia and on me personally. And as others have noted, uh, the Hawke government and then the Keating government governed right throughout my teenage years. And I think, quite apart from some of the individual achievements which were delivered, which I'll mention shortly, what that meant, having that government in power for all of my teenage years, was that it meant that I grew up thinking uh, that long-term federal Labor governments were the natural order of things. Uh, sadly, both recent events and uh, older history shows that that is not necessarily the case. Uh, but I sincerely hope to see that change and to see federal Labor again become uh, the natural order of things when it comes to federal governments. And beyond me personally, I truly think that uh, the government of Bob Hawke and then Paul Keating really did shape the thinking of my generation, uh, Generation X Australians, and their expectations of what governments uh, can do and what they will do, uh, how they will act and how they will treat all in our community with fairness, with kindness, with respect for the people's intelligence and with consideration for both the positive and negative aspects of change and the need to provide for those who do not benefit from change that is introduced by governments. And overall, I think my enduring memory of the Hawke government uh, and its achievements was that that was a government that really made you proud to be Australian. Now, for all of that, I have to admit that uh, through the Hawke Keating governments, I was probably more a Keating man than a Hawke man. Uh, and that was probably just a reflection of the angry young man that I was, and some may say the angry, angry middle-aged man that I have become. Um, I was always very excited by Paul Keating's yeah, grumpy old man uh, in, in training, uh, as Senator Billick says. Um, you know, I, I was more attracted to the, you know, the fight and the passion and the arguments and the invective of Paul Keating uh, at the time. Uh, but I have to say that the older I get, the more I appreciate uh, the strengths of Bob Hawke and what he brought to his government and the incredible personal contribution that he made as that government's leader. Uh, it was his heart, his raw intellect, his intuitive grasp of what the Australian people wanted and cared for, and more than anything, his ability to bring warring tribes together to achieve the common good, whether it be employers and unions, whether it be farmers and environmentalists, and First Nations people, he had an uncanny ability to find common ground and bring people with him to shape a big positive change for the community. And I think that skill is something that obviously all of us in this place can learn from. 
Uh, and I think that was, to me, the major contribution that Bob made, aside from any of the individual achievements, but his incredible ability to bring the Australian people with him, uh, which is uh, recognised in the number of election wins that he was able to deliver for Labor and for the Australian people. Uh, and that was based on a real hallmark of his government being his constant engagement with the public and the peak bodies that represent parts of our community. That was the secret to his electoral success and for the enduring nature of the change that he delivered. Uh, because it's one thing for a government to bring in a change, it's another thing for a government to bring in a change that future governments of different political persuasions simply cannot abolish because they have become so embedded in the national psyche and in what Australians expect of their governments. Now, I've mentioned in passing you know, that Bob and his government did record many achievements, and just briefly I might reflect on a couple of those. Obviously, introducing Medicare after the abolition of Medibank by the Fraser and Howard uh, government, uh, the incredible economic reforms uh, brought in by Bob's government laying the foundations for prosperity and what is now our 28th consecutive year of economic growth, um, the introduction of the social wage delivered in partnership with the business community and trade unions, uh, most prominently um, the implementation and creation of a world-leading superannuation regime, which we are all still immensely proud of. A number of speakers have reflected on the incredible environmental achievements of the Hawke government, the protection of Kakadu, the protection of Antarctica, and in my own home state of Queensland, uh, the protection of the Daintree rainforests and the expansion of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Uh, uh, Senator Dodson, I know, spoke very positively of uh, Bob Hawke's achievements in relations to our First Nations people, in particular the Barunga Statement and even just merely floating the concept of a prime minister, as a Prime Minister of the need for a treaty, something which remains unfinished business for all of us uh, in this place and across Australia. Bob led incredible engagement with Asia, uh, which was uh, most manifested in his leading the development and creation of APEC, uh, an Asia-Pacific trading uh, partnership. He fought racism on the world stage by taking the side of Nelson Mandela uh, uh, um, and his people against the racist apartheid regime of South Africa. He led incredible advancements for women in Australia. Uh, and of course, um, uh, we, none of us can forget the statement that he made uh, in granting permanent residency to Chinese students after the dreadful Tiananmen Square massacre. The thing I just want to focus on, though, um, uh, which I don't think is commented upon as much as it should be, is the achievements of the Hawke government in the education sphere. Uh, Senator Chisholm mentioned uh, the incredible role that the Hawke government played in, in expanding university opportunities for working class kids right across Australia, and that, along with its investment in vocational education and training, really did provide a huge opportunities to so many Australians who hadn't previously had them. Uh, but the Hawke government did more than just invest in people once they'd left school. They did an incredible job in ensuring that more Australian kids remained at school uh, for their full 12 years to set themselves up for life. Uh, in fact, when Bob first came to office in 1983, Australia had one of the lowest high school retention rates in the developed world. At that point in time, in 1983, only 30 per cent of Australian kids completed year 12. When Bob left office, that number had increased to 70 per cent, and it has obviously continued growing ever since. And I have no doubt that that achievement in ensuring that more Australian kids, particularly those from working class and disadvantaged backgrounds, had the opportunity to stay at, stay at school and get a good quality education is another thing which has laid the groundwork for the economic success of Australia over the last 20-odd years. Now, I've noticed and listened to a lot of the speakers today from a, a, across the uh, parliament, and I think it says a lot about Bob uh, that so many speakers today, regardless of their party affiliation, have claimed parts of Bob's legacy. Uh, but I can assure all of you that Bob was a Labor warrior, and his achievements were truly Labor achievements of which we are all incredibly proud. Um, and I, I know a number of people have also reflected on Bob's penchant for singing. And I know personally that every time I saw 
Bob sing that great anthem of the Labor movement, Solidarity Forever, and join in with him in singing that, it was a reminder that for someone like Bob to do that as one of Australia's most electorally successful politicians, it was a reminder that you can be true to your Labor values and be electorally successful. And that is what all of us who seek to form government are really here to achieve. I'll just give one personal anecdote uh, because I, don't know, I didn't know Bob as well as many others in this place. Uh, but I saw Bob's passion for the Labor cause firsthand uh, during my short-lived career as a state member of parliament, as the member for Everton in the Queensland parliament. Uh, now, I, I had one term as a member and heading into my second election, uh, I was sitting on, a, on the incredible margin of 1.4 per cent. Uh, and I was part of a government that I'm sure Senator Scar will, and Senator McGrath will know. Uh, by 2012, it's fair to say that the state Labor government had fallen well out of favour with the Queensland public. So there I was sitting on my 1.4 per cent margin, contemplating my future and facing almost certain defeat. Um, but despite that, and Senator Chisholm has mentioned this as well, despite that, uh, Bob did his Labor duty and came out to campaign in my seat and in many other seats that, frankly, we were very unlikely to win. Uh, now, in keeping with the gloomy prospects of the state Labor government at the time, uh, the day that Bob came out to campaign with me was an absolutely shocking day. Um, it was pouring with rain, driving wind. It was one of those days where, even if you weren't a member of parliament about to lose his seat, you really just wanted to stay in bed and pull the doona up over you. Uh, but Bob did the right thing, and he came out uh, came out to visit and came out to do what he could. And I remember that driving between different campaign events, uh, I think it was between the Gaythorne RSL and the Arana Leagues Club, uh, Bob turned around in the seat and asked me, you know, so young fella, what's the margin out here? What are your chances? And I said, oh, 1.4 per cent, Bob. Uh, and he, his reaction was simply, oh. <laughs> Uh, so the conversation stopped there. So if someone as electorally successful as Bob Hawke could sort of react like that, you really knew that you really didn't have much of a chance. Uh, but nevertheless, Bob worked his magic that day. I noticed, especially with the older women who were in the Arana Leagues Club coming down for afternoon tea, they had a particular affection for Bob. And I know that it gave me and my supporters a huge morale boost to have Bob out there working with us and just for that one moment in what was otherwise a pretty disastrous campaign, we were able to think, you just never know. Uh, of course, it didn't work out that way. Now, the highlight of that particular day, though, um, was that I did something which I later learned one never does with Bob, uh, and that is that I challenged him to a beer sculling competition mm -hmm. in, the, in the Gaythorne RSL. And I remember doing it with uh, the then member for Ashgrove, Kate Jones, and the then premier, uh, Anna Bly. And the worst thing about that I subsequently learned was that I had the temerity as a first-term state Labor MP to actually beat, Bill, uh, beat Bob uh, in the sculling competition. So given his track record in Oxford and other places, I was pretty proud of myself. And I remember turning to the camera, which was filming us, and saying, I just beat Bob Hawke. Uh, and uh, Bob, sharp as attack, turned around and said, yeah, mate, but wait for age. I was all over you. Uh, <laughs> So Bob was always going to have the last laugh. Um, and that sense of humour of Bob uh, was certainly brought to the fore at the magnificent memorial service that was held for Bob recently at the Sydney Opera House. And the two things I took away from that day, being fortunate enough, enough to attend, were the incredibly diverse crowd uh, that was present for Bob's memorial service. And it again reflected the incredible range of achievements in all sorts of, sorts of aspects of life. Um, that so many people from so many backgrounds came together. Um, there were many representatives of First Nations people, there were environmentalists, there were peace activists, there were business people, there were unionists, there were you know, just mums and dads and ordinary Australians out there to express um, how much they appreciated Bob. And I thought it spoke volumes of the man that so many different people from so many backgrounds um, thought that they just needed to be there that day to say their goodbyes. Um, the other thing that I took from that memorial service was the number of times over the course of the day where the speeches uh, made reference to love. Uh, and again, I think that that really captured something that was at the heart of Bob, and that was that Bob Hawke truly loved Australia. He truly loved Australians, and they, in return, loved Bob Hawke back. So Bob 
uh, in closing, um, we loved you. We thank you. Condolences to your family for sharing you with us, uh, and Australia will be forever grateful. Thank you. Senator Billick. I also rise to pay my condolences to the Hon. Robert James Lee Hawke AC, the man that our nation knew affectionately as Bob or Hawkey. I had the honour also, as many of my colleagues did, of attending Bob Hawke's memorial service in Sydney. And I thought it was an incredibly fitting celebration of his personal and public life. It was full of um, entertainment and good humour, but also told the story of how great Bob was. And of course, we all know that Bob had a reputation for being a larrikin. We often hear the media decry how scripted politics has become, while at the same time politicians complain that they do not get fair treatment from the media, therefore they have to tread carefully. And both blame each other, but I think it shows that the practice of politics has changed, and I wonder if we will ever get the leadership style of a down-to-earth, fair dinkum knockabout character like Bob Hawke again. It seems to me that Bob Hawke was a product of his time. It seems inconceivable that Australia today could have a Prime Minister who holds the world record for drinking a yard glass, or who, as recounted in an anecdote from his former press secretary, Barry Cassidy, accepted a lift from a couple of young strangers who called out from their car, Hawkey, you're a legend. As Mr Cassidy explained to the hosts of ABC News Breakfast, Bob called back. If I'm such a legend, give me a lift back to the pub. And then, to the shock of the American VIPs he was hosting, jumped into the car with the two young men instead of taking the official bus uh, or the official buses that were lined up for delegates to the Australian-American Leadership Dialogue. And because Bob was such a good sport, he also chatted with the two young men's mums on their mobile phones while they drove him back to the Hyatt. Bob Hawke was seen as a quintessential Australian. And I think that accounted in part for his popularity. And I say in part because, despite his larrikin nature, he did take the job very seriously, and he achieved an enormous amount as the longest-serving Labor Prime Minister in Australia's history. It was Bob Hawke's government that established Medicare, which has given Australians a healthcare safety net. And we saw in the 2016 federal election the degree to which Australians value, value their universal public health insurance scheme. The Hawke government introduced major reforms to education, in particular the introduction of the HECS system. And while some students may have bemoaned the loss of free education, this contribution scheme gave a massive boost to the number of students who were able to access a university education, but because it was deferred until they had the means to pay, it meant there was no financial impediments. It was Bob Hawke's economic reforms, together with his Treasurer Paul Keating, which laid the foundation for Australia's world-leading almost three decades of economic growth. And the Hawke-Keating government floated the Australian dollar, made dramatic cuts to tariffs and gave the Reserve Bank the power to set interest rates to keep inflation stable. This economic modernisation followed the 1983 Prices and Incomes Accord, in which businesses, trade unions and the government reached agreement on, mining, on minimising inflation while ensuring that the workers shared in the economic gains. And as has been said by many others today, uh, Bob had that ability to be, to be able to bring all people to the table and for everybody to feel like they had, you know, it was a win-win situation for everybody. Under the Hawke government, uh, Australia also had a great deal of confidence and influence on the national stage. And one of Bob Hawke's greatest achievements in foreign policy was Australia's contribution to the international pressure that brought down the apartheid regime in South Africa, a huge advance for human rights. One of the moments that really struck me from Bob's memorial, memorial service was when his granddaughter, Sophie Taylor Price, addressed the service. And there was no clip played with her at about age four, sitting at the knee of her grandfather while he talked about the need for urgent action on climate change. And she explained how her grandfather, in his final months, expressed profound sadness at the world's failure to take stronger action. That said, Bob Hawke had a huge impact when it came to the environment, including preventing mining in the Antarctic and stopping the Gordon Below Franklin Dam project, a move which, while controversial at the time, is now accepted by most people today as having been necessary. 
As Senator Dodson mentioned earlier, another one of Bob's unfinished legacies was his advocacy for a treaty with Australia's Indigenous people. And I'm hopeful that this parliament can make, a significant, can make significant process on the Makarata Commission. Constitutional recognition of Australia's first peoples and a voice to parliament. You cannot serve for nine years as a Prime Minister and not leave an indelible mark on the soul of the nation. Bob Hawke's legacy will be with us for decades, possibly even centuries to come. Australia will miss his infectious smile, his jokes, his larrikinism, his singing. But what we'll, we will really miss more, I think, is his wisdom. Australia will continue to owe Bob Hawke a great debt of gratitude for his service as a great Labor Prime Minister, but also as a Prime Minister for all Australians. Robert James Lee Hawke, AC. Thank you for your service. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Acting President. Uh, this is not my inaugural speech. Firstly, I'd like to extend my condolences to Blanche Delplage and Bob Hawke's family. Many of us were and are great fans of Bob Hawke, as was my father, Neil Sheldon, who passed away many years ago. He was a great admirer of Bob. And on the few occasions my dad, a staunch Labor man, met Bob at Labor and community functions, he told wonderful stories of a man with great intellect, a thirst for knowledge, a great love of sport and his fellow man. Bob Hawke was a man of great skills to settle some of the country's most adverse, seemingly intractable disputes whilst leader of the Australian Council of Trade Unions and, of course, later Prime Minister. But friends, I'll take you back to Frank Sinatra's tour of Australia in 1974 to briefly tell the story of when Bob <laughs> saved old Blue Eyes during the siege of Sydney. In July 1974, Frank Sinatra took the stage at Festival Hall in Melbourne, singing his opening number to great applause. As was his way after the first few songs, he sat on a stool sipping honey tea to relax his, relax his throat before the next number and chatting with the audience. But on this night, the audience was in, and then of course on this night, the audience, as it had been on previous occasions, were in the palm of his hand. He was beloved in Australia and we were happy to see him in person. Now, Frank Sinatra had been in Australia for a week or so and had been hounded by the press for the entire time. He was tired and had clearly had enough. He dropped a bombshell that turned into a sympathy of counter-emotional explosions over the coming days. Referring to Australian journalists from the stage, he said this, the journalists keep chasing after us. We must run all day long. They're parasites who take everything and give nothing. He later went on to say, they're bums and they're always going to be bums. It was turning his tour into a public relations disaster. Not a guy to support women's liberation, he dropped the atom bomb and said that, boards, that broads who work in the press are the hookers of the press. I might give them a buck and a half and I'm not sure. The Australian Journalists Association immediately demanded an apology and Sinatra refused. Industrial action was taken by working people across Melbourne, Sydney and the country against Sinatra and his shows, his flights and even serving him meals. Eventually, he was stranded in the presidential suite at the 23rd floor of the Boulevard Hotel in Sydney. He demanded to speak to the Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, and Gough simply said, the man to speak to was the head of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, Bob Hawke. Subsequently, Bob went on to point out the following and said this to Frank, if you don't apologise, your stay in this country could be indefinite. You won't be allowed to leave Australia unless you can walk on water. Of course, Sinatra's personal outrage caused him to turn to even the US Admiral stationed in Tokyo Bay with the Pacific Fleet to send a Navy SEALs team in to extract him by helicopter from the roof of the Boulevard Hotel in a further attempt to fly home without an apology. Sinatra was turned down by the Admiral, so he then called upon the Teamsters of the USA to come to his aid a union heavily involved in port trucking and distribution across North America and asked them to put a trade embargo on Australia. 
The Teams has rejected this request to get embroiled. Desperate, and his last resort, he decided to talk to the great Australian negotiator, Bob Hawke. Now, as it's told, Bob arrived on the 23rd floor. He was met with a dishevelled, dishevelled Frank Sinatra and his team in a room that smelled of stale cigarettes and sweat. It hadn't been serviced by ho hotel staff for many days. In the middle of that pungent room stood on a pristine dining table a bottle of fine brandy and fine cigars. After many drafts of the statement and many more drafts of brandy, Bob Hawke, Frank Sinatra and Mickey Rudin, Frank's lawyer, managed to hammer out a deal. Ultimately, the joint statement of regret by the crooner and Australia's unionists was read out by Bob Hawke on the steps of Sinatra's hotel. While well, unions had their win for feminism and for, and for Sinatra, he had his payday by completing his Sydney show and having it televised to Melbourne. Bob Hawke, the master negotiator, lifted the siege of Sydney. The crooner left after the Sydney show. He returned to Australia on numerous occasions over the coming decades, forever respecting feminism's vanguard in Australia and Bob Hawke's skill as a negotiator. Vale Bob Hawke. A unionist, a father, a husband, an Aussie through and through will all miss you. Senator Brown. Thank you, Mr. President. When Prime Minister Morrison spoke at the memorial service for Bob Hawke last month, he described the unique relationship Mr. Hawke had with the Australian people. He said, A nation that Bob Hawke loved and that deeply loved him in return. Australia's first people. First Nations people held a special place in Bob Hawke's heart, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and the, their elders past and present and emerging. The Honourable Robert James Lee Hawke AC, Bob, will be remembered for a raft of reasons, well recounted here today and in recent weeks. Floating the dollar, opening the economy to global markets, the accord and its consensus approach to industrial relations, Medicare, banning uranium mining in Jarabaluka, listing of Kakadu National Park on the World Heritage List, land care, just to name a few from the extensive legacy left by the Hawke government, a government that changed the nation for the better. Prior to the election of the Hawke government, the World Heritage Committee had also listed the Franklin River in Tasmania as a World Heritage Site. On coming to power on 5 March 1983, Hawke's government passed the new Conservation Act, and at the end of the Tasmanian state government's challenge on the July 1, 1983, the High Court ruled that, and I quote, there shall be no dam on the Franklin River, end quote. That legacy lives on not only in the physical preservation of that natural wonder, but directly led to the ongoing protections of our nation's natural assets through federal powers, not least the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act 1999. Bob Hawke was also the first Australian Prime Minister to recognise and call for action to combat what we now refer to as climate change. Today I wish to remember another legacy of the Hawke government, tackling gender discrimination in the workplace. Bob was a fierce opponent of discrimination in all its forms. In 1969, an advocate for the ACTU, Bob Hawke successfully argued for equal pay for equal work. With Bob at the helm, the ACTU continued in its advocacy for equal pay, despite the opposition from the McMahon government. Fortunately for the working women of Australia, Hawke's advocacy was matched by the Whitlam government's commitment to equal pay. Hawke's leadership drove the historic equal pay for work of equal value ruling, meaning that, finally, women and men had to be paid the same amount for doing the same job. The Hawke-led ACTU also successfully advocated for the minimum wage to be extended to women. It seems extraordinary when you stop 
and think about it, that women in Australia were not automatically entitled to be paid the same minimum wage and could be paid less than men for doing the same job as recently as 1972. Hawke's leadership, combined with a remarkable team at the ACTU and the political leadership of the Whitlam government, meant that the working women of Australia were finally equal to men. Hawke continued his commitment to and advocacy for equality upon entering politics. Following the 1983 election, Bob Hawke appointed Susan Ryan to the portfolio of Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Status of Women. He also appointed Anne Summers to head the Office of the Status of Women within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Hawke's commitment, along with these two key appointments, ensured that progress in the fight against discrimination was rapid. The Sex Discrimination Act 1984 outlawed, outlawed sex discrimination and protected women from harassment in the workplace. It was introduced to the parliament by Susan Ryan and it passed despite strident opposition from some. Both then Senator Ryan and Mr Hawke then drove the passage of the Affirmative Action Equal Opportunity for Women Act 1986. The act was superseded by the Equal Opportunity for Women in the Workplace Act 1999 and currently the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2012. As with so many reforms that tackle discrimination and disadvantage legislatively, the lineage starts with Bob Hawke in 1984. In 2019, 35 years later, the divide in opinion caused by the proposal of such legislation is interesting to revisit. The sky would fall in and civilisation would end, apparently. The arguments against the bill included, and I quote, the legislation as a whole is tainted with pseudo-intellectualism of selfish, unrepresentative feminism and doctrinaire Marxist socialist precepts of contrived equality defying even the laws of nature. I quote again, men by nature are more likely to be leaders, providers and protectors. We can legislate all we like, but we will not change that. And I quote again, I started to do my research on this women's electoral lobby. They are all women who have had, had problems, etc. They are women who have had something against men. I've looked at the four women on the government side. They're nice ladies. I have nothing against them. I've talked to them. We've talked to each other, but they are all the same. They're always campaigning to save cats, save dogs, save whales. I do not mean that nastily. But the majority of Liberal women are quiet and do not say very much. Well, let's, we know that's changed now, thankfully. Absolutely. Um, there are so, these are just three examples of the parliamentary ramblings against Bob Hawke's Sex Discrimination Act, and that these three examples, of course, are from men. Former Senator Susan Ryan was Australia's first Labor female cabinet member. Member, and in 2005 she reflected on the 1984 Sex Discrimination Act, writing, The Act coincided with a defining moment in Australia's social development. Australia was finally poised for progressive social change. In 1983, those defenders of the status quo who wanted no social change recognised their last opportunity to prevent progress, and they gave it all they had. The Sex Discrimination Bill became emblematic action that, if it was allowed to succeed, it would change Australian society forever. The Sex Discrimination Act 1984 passed and the sun rose the next day. The world did not end. Thirty-five years later, it is, as I've said, the forebearer of vital legislation, not least the Workplace Gender Equality Act 2012. The vision of Bob Hawke and his determination to face down those who fear-mongered at the slightest uh, sniff of change is a hallmark of the man and of the Prime Minister. For economic reforms, for the, from, for the environmental protections, for universal health care and for making anti-sex discrimination the law, our nation is grateful. Bob Hawke did indeed love Australia, and that love drove him to become one of our nation's best loved and most successful Prime Ministers. My condolences go to his widow Blanche, Bob's children, Sue, 
Stephen and Rosalind and his grandchildren. Bob, we thank you for your service and your legacy. Solidarity forever. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to join with so many others today in offering my sympathies to Bob Hawke's family. We know that you grieve the loss of a dearly loved husband, father and grandfather. And like my Senate colleagues who have already spoken, I also wish to record my admiration for the Honourable Robert James Lee Hawke, Australia's 23rd Prime Minister. The breadth of Hawke's contribution has already been reflected in the remarks offered by others today, and I intend to confine my remarks to reflecting simply on Hawke's environmental record. For two reasons, because it was important to me growing up as a girl in the 80s and because of the importance of that record to modern Labor. In 1983, Hawke was given the opportunity to lead Labor on a campaign back to government. And the campaign coincided with an unprecedented community campaign that aimed to prevent the dam on the Franklin River in Tasmania. Hawke opposed the dam and was determined to act where the Fraser government would not. And at a pre-election rally in Melbourne in February 1983, Hawke noted the significance of the campaign. He said, environmental issues have become more prominent in this campaign than in any previous election through the bitter and divisive controversy over the proposed Gordon Below Franklin Dam, the building of which will irreversibly damage a key part of Australia's and the world's natural and cultural heritage. And so one of the first acts of, Hawke, of the Hawke government was to introduce the legislation that would protect the Franklin River. And the World Heritage Properties Conservation Bill was adventurous and creative both from a policy perspective and a legal perspective, and it was ultimately tested in the High Court. The Hawke period is often remembered as the golden age of, economic, of consensus, but these debates were bitterly fought. And the introduction of the legislation to resolve this dispute was faced with uproar from the then opposition. The then Liberal member for Franklin interjected, you hate Tasmania, the lot of you. These ideas were controversial. But Bob had the foresight to look past the day-to-day -day political debate and look to the future, and it took conviction, creativity and leadership to secure the national interest. And these first steps laid the groundwork for his government's approach to conservation. The passage of the World Heritage Properties Conservation Act allowed the Commonwealth to protect Australia's world heritage sites from external threats. From the forests of Tasmania to the Daintree, Australia's ecosystems were listed on the World Heritage Listing and preserved for the future. Bob also went on to convince global leaders of the importance of protecting the Antarctic from mining, and he prevailed in Cabinet to stop the mine at Coronation Hill, listening to the Jawan people and understanding this as an issue of both cultural and environmental significance. Without his determination, Tasmania, the Northern Territory, uh, North Queensland might look very different to how they look today. And I've camped and hiked and visited in all these places, and they are amazing. And it's a legacy of our natural heritage that I seek to share with my children. Bob not only renewed our national story, but he also expanded and renewed the story of the Labor movement. The Labor movement has always known what the power of government can do for working people but also the significance of collective action to secure the interests of working people. And Bob saw the environmental movements of the 70s and the 80s, and he saw them as collective action, and he embraced that broader vision of what collectivism might mean and what it might mean for the Labor movement to be part of it. Our shared interests as a community can be more important than the profits of a single company. And this ethos applies both to our shared economic interests as a community and our shared environmental interests. And when there was a tough fight to be had on the environment, Bob did not shy away. And three decades later, that commitment to the environment and understanding our natural heritage as a shared legacy that we all have a stake in is a core part of Labor's story. Bob embodied the best of the Labor movement. He defended those who were most in need of defending, and he understood that Labor's vision must be large. We have to form a big tent and invite everybody in. We owe Bob a great deal. Bye, Labor.
I ask honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify their assent to the motion. The motion is carried. The Leader of the Government, Senator Cormann. Uh, I move that as a mark of respect to the memory of the late Honourable Robert James Lee Hawke, IC, the Senate do now adjourn. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.